So I use yeah. really heavy tips That's to get true. down into those yeah. fish when the water's low and clear. It's the opposite it of what is. people it's might think. It's kind of counterintuitive, yeah. But it makes sense it if does. you really think it about does. the behavior of the fish. Right. Mm -hmm. So high water, light tip. There you go. Low water, heavy tip. Which is good. So you're, and you're not fishing the heavy water with a light tip. You're finding those kind of those little pillars or the softer water. On the fish. inside the where inside those fish scene. are laying in the heavy, yeah. high flows. That was Marty Shepard explaining how he catches winter steelhead with fly lines on the lighter side. This is episode 76 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Today's episode is sponsored by the Wet Fly Swing Member Society. The society provides exclusive discounts and access to innovative products and services from our member partner companies. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to check out some of the companies who are on board. Plus, you can support the show at one convenient location. In today's episode, I talk with Mia and Marty Shepard, who cover steelhead and smallmouth bass fishing. We talk about how they went from ski bums to full-time guides and fly fishing business owners, then get into some great tips on the John Day for steelhead and bass fishing, the dragonfly hatch, and why we should all be children on the water. Don't miss this one as Marty shares a simple way to understand spay lines and how to fish them. This episode is sponsored by Deli Fresh Design, an all-American creator of fine, sustainable fly fishing gear. Stay tuned later in the show to hear how Ross does his part with DLD to reduce waste and impacts as he builds great equipment in a sustainable fashion. You can find fresh equipment designs on Instagram at Deli Fresh Design or at DeliFreshDesign.com. So... Without further ado, here's Mia and Marty Shepard from Little Creek Outfitters. How's it going, guys? Awesome. Awesome. Great. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so let's jump into. I want to start this off just getting into a little bit on your background and how you got into fly fishing. And we just talked there about how you were into snowboarding in the mid '90s. I think is when you guys met. Mm -hmm. So, I, take us to that point where. So you, you grew up doing some fishing. How did you get into fly? Was it was it Marty that got you into the whole spade game and, and all that? Or how did that begin for so, you? Yeah. So in 1996, got into fishing. Um, and Marty and Josh Lynn, good friend, uh, taught me how on the Deschutes River. Yeah. And... Um, How'd you get into spade casting? Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the guy. So, yeah. So got into spade casting in 2001 roughly so uh, i was living in alaska at the time and marty uh came up to visit with a couple friends and we went out to this little bay called johnstone and uh they were they were fishing for coho and uh, marty started spay casting and i'd never seen it before yeah. that and uh i just loved the style of it in fact i Thought to myself, wow, that's really sexy. Uh -huh. That's probably the first time I thought Marty was sexy. Uh -huh. So yeah. maybe the last. Yeah. <laughs> so um, but uh then um I I came I I came down to Oregon to visit Marty on the John Day River. Yeah. And two thousand and two. Uh, two thousand and two. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I started uh, fly fishing. And you caught your first steelhead steel then. No kidding. Two thousand two. Yeah. So yeah. so ninety six you guys met. Oh, no. no. We, met, we met in the early 90s. Early 90s, okay. Well, let's see. It'd be 94 we met. Okay. Mm -hmm. 94 and then uh, and snowboarding. Mm -hmm. You're both fishing at the time. Both you were steelhead fishing kind of in the spade game kind of got going. When did you start spade casting? When did that all? Is that late in the 80s? So I started spade casting in 1990. Okay, 1990, yeah. So I was 18. Yep. Got a job at Scaria. Yep. I uh, didn't, but wasn't a good learner in high school. Yeah. So I didn't do very good sure. in high school. And I loved to skateboard and snowboard. And I went to work at the ski area. And my boss at the ski area was a guy named Steve Cruz. Now, if you read Deck Hogan's book, yeah. he talks about Steve oh, Cruz okay. in there a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Steve was buddies with Deck and Ed. Okay. Ed Ward. Oh, so, Ed Ward. Yeah, yeah. So, so Steve had all these photos of steelhead on his office wall. 
And I, my first day at work, saw those and went, oh, I'm going to bring in some photos of some of the steel that I caught. Uh-huh. But I was a gear fisherman. Oh, nice. I grew up a gear fisherman. Sure, sure. You know, and I don't have any uh, qualms with how anybody fishes because my dad's a bait fisherman and yep. I love him. Yeah. You know, oh, so. Yeah. yeah. So. So I brought in some photos to Steve, and he goes, those are some nice steelhead. Why don't uh, you let me show you how to catch them with some sole, huh. and I, you show me where you got those things. Okay. You know? And so he gave me my first lesson in 1990. Okay. And I, you know, I, I didn't really catch it first. Like, I didn't really, like, go full-fledged from then on out. Yeah. It was like, okay, right. that was fun. That was cool. So you went from you were gear fishing, and the first mm-hmm. thing you start off was spay casting. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, I didn't really yep. do single-handed there you go. casting. I yep. started out. And do you do it now? Any single-handed casting? Oh, lots. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was funny. You go to Montana and people want to do like micro spay and that's cool right. and all, but it's yeah. like, oh, I want a single-hand cast. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. it's like new uh-huh. or fresh for yeah. me. And so, yeah, trout fishing, we use single-handers here. Bass fishing, we use single-handers here. And uh, we love to go saltwater fishing for tarpon. Mm-hmm. We love to go saltwater fishing. You know, one oh, yeah. day, one day... I hope to catch a permit. I pretty much don't think they exist. I've yeah. gone and oh, really? tried and tried yeah. and tried and tried. Nice. And uh, I love throwing single handers. I love fly fishing. Yeah. I love fishing with bamboo rods and fiberglass rods yeah. and two handed rods and single handed rods. Pretty and much anything, anything fly fishing. Yeah. And what long, do you think? So you're you're gear fishing. I mean, what was the? Because some people gear fish their whole lives. I mean, why do you think you made the change to to fly? What was the biggest thing that that got you? You know, made you switch. And did you switch? Well, you didn't switch just like that. You kind of did a little. It was this. I took. A, it was a long transition to switch. Like I would try to spay cast and try to catch a steelhead, and it was just like impossible. It felt like, you know, I was like, yeah. really, it's really hard to catch a steelhead yep. with a with a fly in the nineties in the winter. You know, and that's oh, what right, I was trying to 90s do. Were tough years, right? I don't know if they oh, were yeah. or not. I, I mean, we really didn't pay attention to yeah. that. It was just like you would just go and go and go and yeah. not catch anything, and then right. like pull out the gear rod and catch one. Yeah. But ultimately I kept going back to it based on the challenge, Mm -hmm. you know? And so like skiing or snowboarding, which we were doing a lot of then you start out on like the bunny hill and that becomes boring really quick. And you go to the blue hill and the blue hill is a little more challenging, but that gets boring really quick. Yeah. And so you go to the black diamond hill and it's like, you just keep challenging yourself. And with anything that's hard, there's a lot of gratification when you finally succeed at anything that's hard. And yeah. so uh, I eventually caught a steelhead yeah. on, a fl- on a swung fly yeah, right. in the winter on a Where? on a, a general practitioner on, on the Sandy. The Sandy. Yeah. And uh, it was like the most amazing day of my life. It was like the feeling of catching that. I'd caught hundreds of steelhead on gear since I was a little kid. Yeah. My dad, we lived on the river. We fished it all the time. But that one steelhead changed my life. Yeah. That one on the swung fly in huh. the middle of winter, you know, and crews had taught me two or three years previously how to spay cast. Were you fishing a real heavy, down and dirty, get down the bottom swinging stuff, or were you just? I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I remember the fish though. Okay, yeah, you know, and it changed me. Yeah, it was like the the feeling of that accomplishment. Like I felt like I accomplished something. <laughs> like I did something significant in my life. Like. I didn't have that same feeling from catching with a steelhead with a spoon mm-hmm. or corky and yarn, right? You know, drifting, and so then I was full on into it. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. And then, and so both of you now, so you learned from Marty how to do it, how yeah, to yeah, spay, I, how to do the cat. And you are, mm-hmm. are you a spay rama like you? Competed, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've competed six times, I think, okay. and uh, won it three three years. So yeah, so, so you have a, you are a champion yeah. space. So how do yeah. you go from? I love it. So I can't remember the exact dates, but somewhere <laughs> in the mid nineties, you start to you pick this up, and now you're a champion. I mean that that shows that you don't have to do this thing your entire life to get good at it. What, what do you think is the the reason that you've excelled? Well, it is a lot of practice. Yeah. It takes a tremendous amount of practice. I started in you know two thousand and two. And, um, yeah, Marty taught me the basics and for many years I had bad habits. Um, and, uh, and then in 2009, I think it was when I decided to start practicing for spay mm-hmm. was when I realized what a, what a shitty caster I was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I went, 
yeah, this is really humbling. It humbled me to go, wow, I don't, I, I don't know how to cast. I honestly think that before you took on the challenge of going to Spearama, that before that you just fly fished because it was a good excuse to be around me. Like I felt like you weren't emotionally attached to fly fishing. I felt like you just kind of, yeah, like, so, like, could we go fishing and then they go on a hike later? You know, and I was yeah. like, yeah, we could do that. And, and I felt like, I felt like when you decided to like, Hey, look, there's a competition where you can go and do this. And you started getting good at it because you started practicing at it. And all of a sudden our lives changed to the better because of the fact that so can i talk <laughs> <laughs> wasn't finished it's, okay yeah. okay here we go yeah, yeah. she's got her voice well, back. Let's hear it. okay here's good but you didn't let me finish <laughs> so. Coffin. exactly i think he was saving you trying to save you from the, the coffin you're good I was the, <laughs> oh you were trying to say, yeah so you're gonna edit this exactly no i don't know we'll see how it goes this is great i'm gonna give you water are you yeah no, are you gonna be yeah no, well well well, yeah, so um, don't, don't edit it. Words. You had two more words. It's perfect. No, this is, this is a great <laughs> letter roll. <laughs> um, but All of a no, sudden, well, we went from... Thank you. You're welcome. We went from... You all of a sudden had this passion for, like, casting, and then that all of a sudden turned you into a better angler. And because you were a better angler, you started planning fishing trips. Like, you went from, like, not much emotional attachment to it to a, like super emotionally invested in it. Yeah. When we first bought our business, I definitely, so we, when we bought little Creek outfitters in 2003, we had a goal of selling it in 10, 10 years. No kidding. Yeah. So none wow. of us had ever ran a business. We didn't know anything about running a business. Um, I was never aspiring to be a guide. This was just a yeah. job. I mean, so what literally. Were you doing at that time, at that moment when you bought the business? Yeah, so in 2003, I was um, going to school, trying to get a degree in some sort of environmental science. I worked seasonal jobs with like uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, yeah. the Zigzag Forest Service doing fishery work, weighted tables at ski areas. I was still really passionate about gotcha. snowboarding. Okay. Like snowboarding was my first my first gig and we bought this business and I'm like, okay, well, wow. I guess now I'm going to start, you know, doing this guiding wow. bass and part time. And then it's funny. It really didn't, you know, and I, and I, and I occasionally it's like, okay, we'll go on fishing trips and, and, and it was fun and all, but, but I wasn't passionate about it until yeah. honestly, when our daughter was born, when our daughter was born in 2007, I, I, something clicked and I went, wow, like we have a huge opportunity here. Like this is an yeah. opportunity. Like we own a business. And were you living here? No, we were living in Welch's. Oh, in Welch's. Okay. So yeah. I just went, this is a huge opportunity to, you know, why not start expanding? Why not get better at spade casting yeah. and doing this, you know, really fun thing that gets me out on the water? Because I love just being on the water. And, uh, and so in 2007, Tegan was born. And that's really when I went, you know, I kind of I want to get better at casting. I started paying attention more, asking people for lessons. Um, Mike, some of those folks were Mike Kenny and Brian Sylvie mm -hmm. and uh, Al Burr and Marty Dwight Dwight, Dwight Clem. And so there was a lot of influence. Um, it, yeah, Mariush. So it was in. So that was 2007, Tegan was born, and I started, um, I remember Marty even saying, like, for years, he's like, oh, you can guide steelhead, you can do it. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't want I to. Know. Like, I don't want to do it, because there is some, there's an emotional, there can be an emotional attachment to catching fish. Yeah. And I needed to get past that. I'm like, I don't want to guide steelhead. And so it wasn't until probably 2008 when I started guiding and, and I, and I had to, and Marty was the one who said, you got to disconnect yourself from the emotion of mm -hmm. catching a steelhead. And, right. I, and just, well, what do you mean by that? Disconnect yourself? from Well, that? you just can't be so, I, I mean, it's, of course we all love catching fish. I love catching steelhead yeah. and it is an emotional process, but 
as a guide, if you're just focusing on like, yeah, you know, we have, to, we have to catch yeah. a fish and get those and numbers. And if you don't, it's going to be a terrible trip. Then exactly. And it isn't about that. It's the yeah. whole process. There's so much more. It's, so if you had trips, I mean, now you've guided a lot for all these different species. I mean, have you had some trips where you get skunked out there? Oh, <laughs> and, and what, yes, and so, many. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. We're we we, we have this discussion a lot. Exactly. No, because it's a good because so, I I've done, and just recently I've done a little bit of guiding, you know, very little. But you know, I really didn't enjoy it. You know, I hated it because I always had that pressure on myself. It was always like, man, I got this pressure, this pressure. Yeah. I got to get. And if I didn't have a good trip, you have to. I felt terrible. Yourself. You have to separate that yourself from that emotional attachment yeah. of getting your your client into a fish. So, if I could add, to yeah, that. Oh, Marty yeah. can talk now. Yeah, <laughs> Thank yeah. You. This is good because we do have people that listen to this. They're guides. Yeah. Or they're, they want to become guys. They want to get going. Yes. Because hearing this, I think, can, can help people. So, yeah. so we choose to target steelhead in the most challenging way I know mm -hmm. how. And with that said, uh, there's probably easier ways to catch steelhead. You could you could nymph an egg pattern from a boat. You can use a spinning rod. You can you can target steelhead in ways. But one of the most difficult ways to catch steelhead, and it takes the most skill or and luck, is to swing up a fish. And swinging a steelhead, in my my mind, is the ultimate challenge. And when you don't succeed trying it the hardest way possible, you can walk out of that day with your head held high. Right. And so yeah. that's the where you have to separate yourself is if I don't catch a steelhead today, swinging flies for steelhead, or if my clients don't, yeah. I can walk away proud. That's right, because they still learn something that. that oh yeah, play. and and there's a lot there's a lot <laughs> of like gratification in doing something that's hard yeah. and having that accomplishment. Mm -hmm. So what I always like hang my hat on is, well, we're going to catch steelhead, so we're going to fly. It yeah. might be the next cast. And it might be the next one after that. Yeah. And if it's not that one, it's going to be the next one after that. And if it's not that one. But eventually, you do catch one. Yeah. And it feels so yeah, good to finally get that <clears throat> off your back. And, right. you know, there's a lot of limiting factors to success. Are there fish in the river? Are they grabby? Are they fresh? Yeah. Are they... Are the conditions perfect? Are the conditions bad? Are the conditions... Are there no fish in the river? You know, mm -hmm. And so all these things factor mm -hmm. into it. And I've had some great days when everything shouldn't line up. And I've had terribly hard, struggling days when everything should line up. Right. And anywhere in between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. yesterday, I guided a guy who had never spake casted before. He was not doing well. He made a really good cast and got one. Oh, wow. No kidding. And That's cool. chrome bright wild hen. And I just looked at that guy in the eyes after we... Yep. netted, tailed, right. released the fish, and said, you realize what you just did was really special. Yeah. And he looked at me and he goes, I do. Yeah. And that meant a lot to me, yeah. to That's realize cool. how special that was. And I said, hopefully this ruins you. And you spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how you did what you just That's did. Right. You That's know? right. Yeah, totally. Like, yeah, because it's not. Yeah, because it, you you will still. Even you, probably both of you, have those days that are still tough. Yeah, I just spent, all the time. I, yeah. I just spent the three days before that guided to, and then I was out one day fishing really hard on my yeah. own, and we haven't got. I, I haven't seen anything in three yeah, days, exactly. and uh, and w was in British Columbia before that for five days and had one grab yep. but two of the people i was with got yeah. got lucky and they hooked fish so it's so yep. random and you just have to keep going out there and and just not lose confidence and uh my friend adrian said that you know this is um, the definition of insanity is going after something and repeatedly doing something over and over again, looking for a different result. Right. I think, oh, you know, we don't get a different result. But you that. eventually right. do, right. yeah. but it might take a while. Yeah. And sometimes. Yeah. So it's almost insanity. It's yeah, almost insanity. But steelhead no. fishing is insane. Yeah. <laughs> it is. No, it's good. I know. I think, I think anybody that's you know, listening to this, they know what, what we're talking look, about. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Look, here's the, the, if we base our lives judging each other from social media accounts yeah, we're really doing because 
because the image that we try to set forth is that like look we're having this massive success like we're always got your steelhead like yeah. here's another mm -hmm. photo right. and truly our success comes from pure determination and opportunity and we have opportunity mm -hmm. because we have clients that book trips with us day in and day out we're, we're working <clears throat> five days a week yeah. all winter long huh. and and you're gonna we're gonna catch some fish doing that yeah so our success comes mm -hmm. from lots and lots and right. lots of time on the water when, when you look at the time say the the sandy or the winter fish do you find out of the you're probably doing a similar run most of the time yeah. are you finding that you're getting you know the 80 20 getting 80 percent of the fish out of these small little buckets of these spots or are you finding fish throughout different runs all day long yeah maybe more like 90 percent. oh yeah, yeah yeah so you got they these come few, from very specific yeah. spots because you might have what uh a hand half a dozen spots you hit during a, a day yep. or something yeah. like that and, and then those are your key spots you know mm -hmm. that's where fish hold and yep yeah yeah you, you start when you're out there all the time you start to learn what fish is better at what water level right. and um and then and then you can hone yep. in on those spots and that's yep. you know the, the biggest recommendation i could give somebody is yeah. you know just get out there and get to know your water and fish the same spot over yep. and over again and and see you know, and, and pay attention to the water level yeah. on the USGS site and, and, you know, write down those CFS mm -hmm. and, uh, and then start fishing those spots when you, when you catch one at a thousand, then you know, that's a spot where you can get them at a thousand. Exactly. If you fish it at 5,000, you might not, it might not fish as well. Yep. So. Yeah, so, yeah. There's very few random fish. The, mm -hmm. They do exist when they're moving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, when they're not, when they're moving, they're hard to catch. And so, Holding fish is a much easier fish to target and catch. And there's certain places they like to hold. Yeah. The hydraulics are right. The water level. There's lots and lots and lots of different opportunities. There's also lots of places that where they hold where our flies just won't present right, right. to them. Right. So yeah. those are the hardest ones. It's yeah. like, we, you know, we float over these pods of fish every day. Mm -hmm. And at low, clear water, we see them. Yeah. And there's spots where we catch them out of those spots even on the low clear days it's harder when it's low and clear yeah. but there's also spots where you just can't catch them out of there i don't know why and yeah. the fly may not present right to them or it just doesn't get in their zone or just something about it yep. doesn't work yeah so you, you got to find as a steelheader the things that work for you and then go back to that well yeah because that well's got water in that's it right. you know that's and right. so keep going back yeah well, I wanted to, uh, I mean, that's, that's the tough thing is that we're on the Deschutes. We're talking about the same. These are all rivers that, you know, I'd love to talk more about. Maybe if we have time, then we can get into it. But I did want to talk about the John Day because that's another one that I think is maybe not on a lot of people's radar. You know, I know there's bass. You do some bass trips and then there's steelhead. I was hoping we can talk a little about just how you catch steelhead on the John Day. And maybe you could break down what a day, you know. So you're here. You're heading over the John Day because that's a big water dependent, the longest free flowing river in the state, right? So you have all these issues with water, low flows and too high flows. Yeah. Can you talk about how you catch steelhead over there? I don't know if whoever wants to well, take the, or you both, or I mean, I don't even know because I'm not sure who fishes more over there. You fish to hit the bass stuff, or yeah, we, well, we, we both we, work over there. Okay, a lot. you both do we, guiding we, steelhead. We both okay. Do. And we kind of do different things. Yeah. So Marty focuses more on the multi-day trips. I'll do one if I can get on it. Um, and then I'll do day trips. And that's just because of the logistics of being a parent. Oh, right. And yep. so someone has to be around Tegan and uh, get her to school. Gotcha. And um, and so it's convenient for me to do day trips. Yeah. And um, occasionally, though, she'll go spend a week with a friend, mm -hmm. and then I get to go on a multi-day trip. Mm -hmm. but, um, oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So you got so on a multi-day trip, that might be a, a three-night or something. Four, four, yeah, nights. four okay. days, five days. And are, mm -hmm. is there is that a pretty, is the John Day, I mean, people can do their research to get over there, but is it is there a lot of traffic over there, I mean, when you're fishing? Well, there's more and more and more than yeah. there used to be, for sure. Yeah. You know, there's some more public access than there used to be. Western Rivers is... is has bought some large ranches and, yeah. and, and, you know, transferred that land over to public agencies and yeah. that, that has definitely driven more traffic. Right. So there's more opportunity to get on that river. And so, and is it boat traffic and foot traffic? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both. Yeah. Both. Okay. Mm -hmm. What and is so, it, is it similar to, you know, if the Deschutes are out here for summer steelhead, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, if you know the Deschutes swinging flies, is it, is it pretty much the same sort of, it's not okay. even close. Yeah. Maybe you can explain how you catch yeah. steelhead over there. Yeah. Then. So, one of the things that um, let's just look at both rivers and how they're built differently. 
The Deschutes is a tail water that has a dam on it. It's controlled. The water levels stay relatively stable here at around 4,500 CFS. Mm -hmm. The John Day is a long, free-flowing river. has irrigation on it. It has um, no control, though, over water flows. And it's a much more gradual river with a lot less water in it. Okay. So what it has is average flows during steelhead season are 450 CFS. So what is that? Ten percent of what the district yeah. is? Well, wow. that's average. So, so you might get yeah. a two thousand yeah. CFS event, and then you might get down to what a hundred or something. I would not like say that? that you might get a two thousand. Oh, really? Two I don't know that I've ever seen okay. a fall over there where the river got up at two thousand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you got up to eight hundred, I'd okay. be surprised. Yeah, we just don't have a lot. Like a lot of the precipitation that comes in the fall mm -hmm. gets soaked into the ground. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So, it gets, so it's pretty low flow, and is it, yeah. is it clear? Very, is it clear so water? So they, they irrigate the river from about oh, right. June 1st through October 1st. That's right. And so they shut off irrigation October 1st, and the river slowly That's rises. Right. But we've seen it at 50 CFS Yeah. In at the end of September. So when is the prime time for steelhead fishing there? November. November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so that is a different – because you think about the fish here, you've yeah. got a July through the summer. See, what people – need to realize is that the John Day runs really low. Yeah, that's the by, by Ju Ju July gotcha. 20th, most years, we're down below 100 yeah. CFS, cubic feet per second. Yeah. And if if we have any drought conditions, which we live in the desert, that's what we have, yeah. is drought conditions. Exactly, yeah. From from late July through September, that river will get down to 50 CFS. That's it. Wow. So, so – and that's not a normal. Yeah. It's not Yeah, it's just abnormal. a natural system. It's just or, natural. Well, there's irrigation. It's probably how the Deschutes would be yeah. if it didn't have a dam on that's it. Right. You know? That's right. And so it might be a little more because the metolius really runs right, right. cold yeah. and heavy. But um, the the John Day will then slowly creep up after the irrigation shut off. Yeah. And so it can go from 50 CFS mm -hmm. to 250 in about three weeks. Yeah. Wow. So now we're at yeah. late October. Yeah. And after late October, those fish will start coming in because of that small bump in water from 50 CFS to 250 CFS. And it, if you get a little moisture or a little rain, it can come up to 400 CFS. That's when you really want to start targeting okay. it because the river is going to actually swing your flies. Yeah. You see, at 250 CFS, your nothing. flies just don't even swing. Yeah. The the John Day is like a series of lakes and shallow riffles oh, wow. at 250 CFS. No kidding. Into a lake of uh, a shallow so how riffle. Are you, so where are you hitting the, the fish? Where are you swinging the fish up? It's really hard at 250 CFS. Yeah. So it's, that's why we wait till November. Okay. So at 400. It's a lot more viable <laughs> to swing a fly. Gotcha. And so because you got to realize that the Chutes or the Sandy or the North Umpqua or all these rivers are built different. The John Day is built where it's long pools, a yeah. mile long. So, you, and you're, are you fishing just certain sections of these pools or the tail outs? Or like we're you, fishing usually early in the season. Um, you can fish the ripples, okay. of course, yeah. and the water's going to be a little bit warmer. And then, as the season progresses um, and the, the the river comes up 100 cfs, yeah. you can start fishing those a little bit longer and down into the sh to the slow water. Gotcha. So especially when it gets cold. Yeah, when it gets cold, you can fish. You can literally smoke a cigar and swing a run really? <laughs> and still not be done swinging. No, okay, yeah, you can yeah. all day in one run. Yeah, when, when yeah, the water you gets just cold, they fish go, that slow water. Gotcha. They go to the deeper, more structured parts. Oh, okay. So the type of yeah. characteristics I look for as an angler on the John Day or a guide on the John Day or the middle of a deep pool where a canyon comes in because where a canyon comes in there's going to be structure. Yeah. So they're going to they're going to lay where there's depth and structure. Yeah. Now even if there's not a current that will swing your fly, they'll still lay there. Yeah. Now if you have a current that just barely swings the fly where there's depth and structure, yeah. That's where we catch our fish. You. And are you fishing just dry lines, small flies, typical summer steelhead? A little bit of both. Yeah, mm -hmm. it changes as the temperature yeah. changes. Yeah. So, yeah. so we use class skaters. Yeah, when the river so is forty-eight gotcha. degrees. So earlier on, you're, you're mm -hmm. skating, and then as you get into the later, colder. By Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. the water is usually down to thirty-six degrees. Wow. 
So, Holy cow. and by December, the river usually freezes there over. There we go. Okay, so you're not fishing. In, well, and then by spring, they're getting into spawning and all that. So you're done fishing by... It's a month season. By it's December. Month. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. So you yeah. get in November. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a short little season. Yeah, yeah. it is. Huh. Yeah, I've seen the river freeze over December 3rd, December 10th, like solid. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And then it doesn't defrost until end of January. Yeah. So without giving away any, any spots, people can figure out if they want to go over there and hit it up themselves. But any mm -hmm. tips on fishing the John Day other than what we just talked about there, if they wanted to try to go out there for their first time and find a finish? Any, mm -hmm. Anything special that you, know, you might tell somebody? Anything special? Um, I mean, you could well, do it. In you terms could of access or just... Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. if you had an access yeah, tip you know, or... Uh, the, yeah. the, Access um, has always been a challenge until recently. Like Marty said, yeah. Western Rivers purchased um, a large piece of property and then it turned into Cottonwood State Park. And wow. so um, that now provides access. That's right. uh, and, and, and that's a good place, place yep. to go. Uh, and then there's um, Rock Creek, which is down on the lower river. And that's yep. another public access yep. spot. Um, and, you know, in terms of uh, tips, just you just you know, just steel it. fishing, just get out yeah. there and go, um, you know, bring uh, an arsenal of, uh, of gear, just have a uh -huh. Scandi line and a Skagit line yeah. and, um, and pay attention to, to water temperatures. Flows. So yeah. what is, so you think that 400 is the, if you had to say one flow, you, you want it the best. Yeah. Yeah. You want to start fishing it. Um, I really encourage people say, you know, you, you want to fish it above, 400 CFS okay. because it gives the fish an yeah. opportunity to move and not, you, you, you know, they're, they're, they're able to have some space to move gotcha. around. Okay. And, and is there, is there camping, plenty of camping over there? I guess at this place, is there a Cottonwood state park has yeah. camping. So there's actually campgrounds. Could you like yeah. literally drive in like an RV sort of thing? Or is yeah. it more technical? Yeah. You could. Yeah. As long as it's self-contained, yeah. there's not a yeah. sewage. This there. sounds pretty cool to me. I mean, I, I, I love the, unimproved you know it's like you're in your boat you camp wherever you want you can have that experience so it sounds like that this is a good place for that if you want mm -hmm. to do, yeah, do yeah. something like that yeah, yeah um, it's, it's a beautiful beautiful place it's it's, it's a huge state park it it's is about huge. 16 miles a river wow holy cow but you can't just at, drive up and down that 16 miles no you gotta walk yeah that's which is great, great though yeah. because that's your whole thing walk two miles upstream you're yeah. away from the yeah like, most people mm -hmm. so that's a good okay now, the John Day is unique, kind of unique, because, um, you know, bass. So so bass or steelhead, which one is better? Steelhead. <laughs> steelhead right. But, right, but you guys, you do a lot of bass fishing trips. But bass are a whole lot of fun. Yeah. They're so much fun. Yeah. And it's a nice change of pace to be able to target a species that will just take any fly. Right. It doesn't matter. You throw it out there. You throw out a popper, strip it yeah. in. And they just hammer it. And these are smallmouth bass. Smallmouth bass. Can I tell you a story? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I was at a trade show. and uh, Which one? I think it was San Mateo back in the day. It was uh, maybe oh, 10 yeah. years ago. Okay. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of characters at these trade shows. There's guys giving presentations. But some of them are really, like, legends that you, like, you can't miss them. And so Lefty Cray walks by the booth that we're working at, and I say, hi, Lefty. And he looks at me, and he goes, what are you doing here? And I don't know him. Yeah. And he, I said, <laughs> well, we're we're selling guide trips. And he says, oh, well, uh -huh. uh, he sees a picture of a bass on our, oh, yeah. on our background. And he shakes my hand, and he looks at his hand after he shakes it, and he goes, this man stole my ring to everybody around. No way. Yeah, and I'm, like, embarrassed. And he's like, <laughs> I'm just kidding, you kid, you know. And and he says to me, he goes, um, do you have a second to talk? And I go, yeah, well, yeah, I'd love to talk to, with you. you know. And he says, okay, let's get away from all these people. And he kind of brings me over to the corner of the, the hallway there. And he says, do you see all these people walking by? And I say, yeah. And he says, most of them want to catch a trout. Yeah. And I say, yeah. And he says, here's the thing about trout. He says, when a trout comes up and eats your dry fly, your heart goes, pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter. <laughs> he says, that is awesome. That's why they love it. It gets their heart going, yeah. gets their adrenaline going. That's why they love it. Now, here's what I want you to tell these people that come up and go, smallmouth bass, what are you doing that for? 
He said, because when a smallmouth comes up and eats your popper, it explodes and you have a heart attack. Yeah. And yeah. he walked away. I've never talked to him since. Really? You know? Yeah. That was your one time with Lefty. That was my only time <laughs> yeah. I ever talked to Lefty. And he was he was so excited he was he to, tell, to tell me about how, you know, a bass taking a dry fly is like the best the thing ever. Yeah, because you know, he is a, he's is. done it all, but he is a, He loves bass he loves fishing. Bass. And I'll tell you what, any fish that eats the surface fly, yep. in my book, yeah. is a worthy yep. opponent. Exactly. It's so fun. Yeah, yeah. So much fun. And yeah. so, so you know, you hear these stories about the shoots and the salmon fly hatch. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. hear the stories of the Madison and, right. and the Mother's Day caddis hatch. Yep. And you hear these stories of all these famous hatches. Right. But there's a famous hatch on the John Day for smallmouth bass that no one talks about. No kidding. Mm -hmm. And it's really epic. Uh, no kidding. It's, it's mm -hmm. called the Dragonfly Hatch. Mm -hmm. The Dragonfly Hatch. Yeah. yeah. Which is, and when, so when is that? Cool. When, when is the, it's, uh, it usually starts around the end of June and goes yeah. through the first three, few weeks of July. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it is absolutely no amazing. amazing. Wow. Here's why. Do you want to tell them why? Well, the bass are literally cartwheeling out of the no water kidding. just to catch them. Wow. They in try the to sky. catch them in the air. They yeah. are, it's so That's cool. Awesome. So much fun. Holy cow. So this yeah. is, yeah, this is, I mean, right here, this, is, this sounds like <laughs> steelhead are great, but yeah. yeah. It's so fun. So you're starting to convince me that maybe that initial question, steelhead versus bass, that maybe bass might be. <laughs> They're just different. Yeah. yeah. So different. bass is like our ultimate Very revenge yeah. on like how hard steelheading is. Because <laughs> yeah. bass fishing is not hard. Right. Yeah. Bass fishing, we offer these like fully yeah. guided trips. We offer these self-guided trips. We will, we, on our self-guided trips, we provide the boats. We provide the camp, we provide the food, we provide everything. It's just like a fully guided trip. Yeah. But we literally, the John Day is so easy to row yeah, that we would just throw it. like our daughter who's 11 in one of the boats and go, go for it, we'll see you at camp. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah. and she could probably guide herself and do 50 bass right. in a day. And it's, the weather's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so perfect for kids. Yeah. And yeah. we've been doing kids, we've been guiding kids since yeah. the beginning of time. And so is this, this is the kids camp. Yeah. So, and, yeah. Because I want to dig into this a little bit too. That, and you do all those mostly on the, is the John Day? Yeah. So on the John Day and this year we're doing uh, a teen summer, summer camp on the Deschutes as well. But uh, yeah, we're doing a kids camp for on the John Day for sixth through eighth graders. Uh -huh. And it's five days, four nights. And it's just getting them outdoors and teaching them about rafting and water safety and fishing huh. and camping and wow um, and is it just the kids no parents no no parents so it's just you so. two doing this with yeah nope, just no. the kids so so it's it's us and then uh we this year, super excited oh, to yeah, hire yeah 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 our good friend kiki who uh -huh. is has an environmental science background okay. and she's gonna be um provide professional instruction on all the environment. Oh, okay. Side. Kiki gotcha. Cruz, her dad taught me how to speak. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, wow. wow, there you we, go. We've That's been, cool. we've, we've seen huh. Kiki like grow up and we've fished with her since she was probably nine. She started coming on bass trips. So this, she was just a little kid. This segue to a good story about how we yeah. bought our company. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. Yeah. This is perfect. <laughs> perfect. Well, let me, uh, but yeah, so let, let's finish up on the, okay. the kids stuff because I'm interested and then we'll go into the, okay. uh, the company story because yeah, that was one thing the uh, Little Creek Outfitters, I definitely wanted to hear about that because that wasn't a company that you necessarily started. Mm -hmm. You bought it. So that's a cool story. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so the kids, so take me to, uh, you know, you have these, a uh, three day trip. What is it like? You get these kids day one, you know, can you take me, take me through what, what that's like and for the kids? Say, yeah. say if you're a kid, you're, what, what do you expect for a trip like this? Well, the, so, so, so the first day parents, you know, take, they, uh, they follow us to the river and, um, so they meet you on the John yeah, day. Yeah. Yeah. They meet, meet us on the John day and you can tell the kids are really shy and they're a little nervous. Um, and are some of these kids kind of like. Have never been on a river in their life. I, I, in the yeah, city yeah, whole. yeah, yeah. There, there's yeah. a couple that have right. ne never been on. Because that's that. kind of a, a safety thing there, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a, a drowning <coughs> thing. There's rattlesnakes. There's yeah, yeah. So you know, there, we, we definitely take a lot of safety precautions, and yeah. kids have to wear their life jackets. Yeah. Um, it's a requirement. Until, Do you have any until sort of a, like uh, push the EPIRB and a helicopter flies in and takes them to the hospital? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We we yeah. carry it's an in reach. Yeah. So a Garmin Perfect. in, in yep. reach. Um, and yeah, so kids, you know, they, you know, we give it the safety talk and, yeah. and they hop in boats and we, we paddle board as well. Oh, wow. So we provide a couple there of paddle boards and, and, and all these kids have um, never 
you know, they don't have any rowing experience. And by the last day, they're all like fighting to no take kidding. over the paddleboard. And you have rafts. They, and rafts. rafts? Yeah, so yeah, rafts and, and rafts. Yep. No yeah. drift boats on this section. No one. Oh, it's too low for drift boats, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it yeah. depends on the water level. Okay. But the kids, um, you know, they, I, I remember two, two boys on a trip, they, you could tell they didn't want to be there yeah. at first. They were just right. like, my parents yeah. forced us to yeah. be here, mm -hmm. don't want to be here. And by the last day, we do a, um, um, uh, uh, a uh, I don't know, I just, I just had a little. All I know is those two boys that don't want to be here want to come back. They, they want to come yeah. back. Yeah. And uh, and we do a little talent show on the last day. I'm okay. And uh, it's amazing how you just see these kids blossom and they, you know, they just, they're building their confidence. Yeah. They're, they're, by the so end, cool. they're like, we want to come back and do this. And are some of these kids, par the parents are not outdoors people and... Yeah, that's kind yeah. of an interesting dynamic too. I imagine a lot of them are, and maybe yes, it, yeah. So that this year, um, I've I, I've been talking to quite a few moms, mm -hmm. and um, and I've heard the story of like, you know, I, I want to send my son on this because we don't have the camping gear, right. and we don't have the, time, the, and the time, we have to we have to work, or we or, want a break. I'm, Maybe a break yeah, from the vacation or, or something. Yeah, like that. or I'm a single mom and I just don't have the resources. Yeah. And um, so this year we're we're cool. offering scholarships as well oh, wow. to get four kids cool. on these trips. And how um, many kids total can you do? You Twelve take? on each trip, Twelve and that's what we're limited because of our permit. Oh, um, so we're limited to sixteen. So you actually people. have a, a guide permit. For that river. Yeah. So yeah, the the, the John Day Deschutes, you have to have what's called a yeah. special recreational permit. <coughs> That's right. Um, and so we we have that, and under that yeah. permit, we have one on the Grand Ronde. Yeah. yeah. John Day oh, yeah. Deschutes. Okay. And the Owyhee. And the Owyhee. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, this is pretty uh, interesting because the um, it was funny because Megan, my partner, we had been talking about um, doing this exact thing. Okay. It, it's so funny because I talk about the guiding is that I didn't really like guiding. But she really, you know, she's totally, we got, our kids are five and seven, and she's just totally, you know, we're into them, and, you know, she that's her whole life is, is yeah. the kids. But, she, but we're trying to figure out a way for something that she can do, mm -hmm. you know, and she just kind of came up with this idea. Actually, before we even talked, out of the blue, okay. and I was like, oh, that sounds like an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. take kids, out. and it wasn't the exact thing, but yeah. basically take kids to a, a fly fishing camp. Yeah. Teach them how to fish and stuff like that. So sure. this is sounds okay. like it's a little more. But would you have a tip for you know somebody that was maybe going to start something up and do something similar? Um, well, I first I got to say that it's. I mean, it's so important to get kids outdoors, especially in this era of video games and kids are playing more yeah. inside. And if we're going to you know, find people to be the next stewards and advocates of the places that we love. You know, we got to teach our kids. We got to get them stoked on the outdoors and we got to do it in a fun way. Right. And, and I, so um, for somebody that's wanting to start a camp or do something like this, um, it's really uh, just, you know, look, look to your community um, and uh, just. Yeah. So the community, that's, a, that's, and we've been talking a little bit to some of the community and asking people. I guess it's probably hard to find people that will say it's a bad idea. Yeah. And we've been asking a few people, yeah, yeah, what do you think of this? And most of them are like, oh, this is great. It's, yeah, it's a great it. idea. I don't yeah. think there's, I mean, there's, again, there's so many kids out there. Yeah. And, and you know, the more opportunity that they have to have an experience like that, then 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 that's that's great. That's cool. It's so you know, awesome. Yeah. You know, we have an 11-year-old. Yeah. So you have... Yeah. You know, a couple little ones yeah. that are five and what? Five and seven. Five and yeah. seven. And, <clears throat> you know, we were that age. Yeah. We were 11. That's we were right. five. Oh, we yeah. were seven. Yeah, I remember. Do you guys remember it was like it was oh, yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> you know, and so the opportunities that we had then mm -hmm. molded us mm -hmm. to be where we are today. And, you know, it fits into like our guide philosophy, not only from like, trying to do these kids camps which is new to us like we're yeah. three years in okay three it. years in gotcha. yeah and and we're slowly growing it to yeah. where we foresee it being but we have a long ways to go with mm -hmm. what we want to do there yeah. yeah and but going back it, like our guard philosophy with you know 60 year old men is yeah. like they were 11 once and fishing in my viewpoint should be treated like we're all children because yeah. you know it's really fun and fascinating, yeah. and ha the the sense of exploration that kids have, mm -hmm. 
it's in all of us, no matter what our age is. Right. And so if we all treat fishing like we're kids, yep. do you know how much fun that is? Right. Do you know how much yeah. fun you have if you approach the river like an 11-year-old and not it's, a 70-year-old? Right. You know? It's so like, fun. Exploring. And yes. It's so much fun. Yeah. I think people tend to take it too seriously yeah. a lot. Yeah. And you just have to be a kid again. Exactly. And, and I, I, I pride myself on being, yeah. you know, the oldest immature person that's right. in the boat at well, times. And that's a good tip, too, because, I mean, the observing thing is something that's, that comes up on a lot yeah. of my podcasts with the guests. We, I ask you about a tip in observation. Yeah. And that's the thing I know. I mean, I kind of struggle with that because I've always done something and like, okay, I know how to do it. But observing what's going on. Yeah, is a big part there's of so many intricacies of the outdoors. And if you just stop and listen and, and look around, it's like you see the geese yeah. honking that overhead. That 10-year-old's alive in all of us. Oh, yeah. it's, exactly. It is. It never goes and, away. And fly fishing can bring it out if yeah. you if you allow it to, if you right. allow yourself to be a kid again. Yeah. And and. And it's okay to make a bad cast or it's, you know, you don't have to get out there and look like a hero. <laughs> yeah. Just have fun and, right. and make mistakes yeah. because mistakes, when you make mistakes, you learn. Exactly. So, That's great. Okay. Well, yeah. let's go back to this story because you had a story about how the business mm. came to be. The, maybe you can right. Tell well, me, what was the connection? I can't remember exactly. Kiki Cruz. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, Kiki. Kiki. Yeah. You want to tell so, the story yeah. there? So I worked at Timberline for 12 years. And you were a ski instructor? No. I did all kinds of different jobs, and yeah. so but during that time yeah. before you got into guiding, and yeah, you were how did you make your living? Uh, scary. That was it. So working, mm -hmm. you were yeah. pretty much yeah, okay. Yeah, and so um, my boss loved to fly fish, taught me how to spay oh, cast. Oh, there you go. That's right, Steve. And um, I had lots of good jobs at the Scaria, and you know, could do different things. But um, I'm going to kind of dive into this whole story because. It all comes around. So in 2001, I went to Alaska to go fishing where Mia said. Oh, so yeah. Coming back around. And where was this in Alaska? Oh, John. Mia was living in Girdwood, but we went to fish Little Johnstone Bay. Bay. Is this like Southeast Alaska? Or? Yeah, it's in Prince mm -hmm. William's okay. mm -hmm. right. And uh, we got up there and went fishing, and, had it, and it was just a vacation. But we were scheduled to fly out on 9-11, 2001. Wow. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. Jeez. Yeah, a couple planes yep. hit some big buildings. So you were up there in Alaska when that we were, I was. Mm -hmm. We were flying out. Mia was literally driving. She was living in Alaska. She was driving my buddy Tim and myself to the airport Yeah, to wow. fly home. Yeah. And we stopped at a gas station. And Mia knew somebody at the gas station because I think it was like where you lived. And they were like, where are you going? And Mia was like, oh, I'm taking these guys to the airport. And they're like, you might want to look at the news. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we went and looked at the news and it was like tragic, mm -hmm. you know, and shocking. And um, we ended up staying in Alaska for two or three weeks. and Because flights were canceled. Yeah. yeah. And so, so um, when I came back, finally made it home, I'd missed work for three weeks or something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my bosses at work had booked a grand round trip and that grand round trip was with this outfitter named john eckland at little creek outfitters oh and i think they wanted to do like four people or six people on the trip and the outfitter could only do four or something like that or somehow or another they brought me along as like the third guide oh wow and you had never no it. and it was awesome the grand round yeah. was beautiful like this is with my bosses. This and is the, like a November steel. Yeah, it was like late October. Yeah. And the and the the outfitter, John Eckland, he was a fascinating guy and a funny st storyteller and a, a hilarious dude. But he has, his history was cool. He had like guys like Bill McMillan work for him. Oh really? He had Deck Hogan wow. guiding mm -hmm. for him. Okay. He had he had like he well, had this so really was he the Laurie main Murphy? Laurie Ann Murphy, oh, yeah. Yeah, Patty, Patty Riley. Riley. What, what, like so was a, he the main yeah. Grand Ron fly guy? Yeah, but he mm -hmm. had the shoots permit, yeah. the John Day permit. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so and so, you know, he goes, You should come back and do a couple trips with me. As a guide. Wow. And my bosses who are all drinking yeah. whiskey are going, oh, yeah. yeah, you should do it. Really? You know? Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I guess I'll come back and yeah. do it. And, you know, and so I came back and started. Came camp. back that season? Yeah, like yeah. the next trip. The next trip, yeah. yeah. And guided. Cool. And, like, and at that time, well, what year is this? 01. 01. So you yeah. hadn't 
You just oh yeah, you just had started spade casting a couple years before. Well, no, about ten years. Oh, ten years before, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've been doing this a while. Yeah, eleven years. I've yeah. been so you're good at you're good at yeah yeah yeah. yeah you, we you just, just haven't guided. I had just done a trip on my own gotcha. to Alaska to catch silvers on spade oh, casting. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. Then right. that's where Mia was first saw it and said. Ah, oh, that's kind of sexy. That's right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I gotcha. Okay, so yeah. at this point, you got ten years of spay, and yeah. you're good. It's just the yeah. guiding thing is new to you. Yeah, and but I had been taking people fishing for years, yeah. and that's why those guys had confidence in me to like be the third guide. And so, let's see, John Eckland, who owned Little Creek Outfitters, he loved to go to Cuba. No, well, and he would go mm-hmm. with Filippo and these guys that run Avalon, these Italian mm-hmm. guys that run the Cuba operation. He would go two or three times a year. He loved to go to Cuba. But after 9-11, Homeland Security was formed by oh. George W. Yep. And old Eklund, he hated George W. Right. because of that. Because yeah. it made it really hard for him to go to Cuba. Oh, uh, that's right. And so he literally, like, I came and did a couple bass trips with him. I did the next mm-hmm. year, 2002, steelhead trips. Mia came down. We started the John Day Steelhead program. Mm-hmm. Mia came down mm-hmm. and was hanging out with us during 2002. Like I think you spent the whole Steelhead season yeah. hanging out yeah, I was, yeah. at what we call the Garage Mahal in Condon, Oregon. Oh, yeah. And and Eklund comes to me and he goes, if George W. gets reelected, I'm moving to Argentina. No way. Yeah. And I go, oh, okay. Whatever. Yeah. And George W. got reelected, and he goes, I'm I'm doing it. I'm moving to Argentina. Yeah. You're going to buy my company. I go, I am? Wow. You know? And I and Mia and I, I don't know, we've been dating like six months maybe, and I'm yeah. like, hey, maybe we should like look into this. <clears throat> we didn't have any money. Yeah. You know, we're like, we're broke. Sure. We're skiery oh, yeah, employees. You're ski, you're ski and, yeah. and fishing guides, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and so, so we looked at it. We checked it out, and... I wrote up like a semi business plan, like, okay, here's how we would pay it back sure. if we were able to borrow the money. Yeah. He wanted a big amount of money for it, but it came with boats and a full client no list kidding. and it came with all this good stuff. And he was like, Let's do this. I'm moving. I'm out wow. of here. And he did. He moved to Argentina and he grows grapes in yeah. Mendoza and stomps on them and makes Malbec wine now. So he's still and, down there. And mm-hmm. and we wrote a business plan and we were trying to think about who to shop it to. And one of our mentors and advisors was Steve Cruz, the guy who taught me to spay cast. Oh, yeah. He was my boss at the Scaria. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. we, I ran by that business plan by him going, what do you think? And he goes, well, I think you should, instead of like paying interest, yeah. you should probably like think about just giving away guide trips. Oh, yeah. And I go, oh, that's a good idea. So he goes, make some changes and, and think about who you want to submit it to. And I'm like, I got a couple guys that I guided that I had in mind to submit it to. Yeah. And literally, I took it back to Steve and said, check this out. What do you think? And he goes, everything looks good. And he wrote me a check. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. And I was yeah. like, oh, no, I Amazing. got the money now to buy no this kidding. business. Yeah. And Steve, Steve's idea Jeez. was, look, pay me back monthly. Yeah. We'll get it on a payment program. Right. And then uh, for the rest of my life, I'm going to have free guide trips. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So his wow. his yeah. kids were – Sid is his wife, and his kids were really young. And we basically did trips with them every year on the John Day for oh, yeah. Bass. And mm-hmm. we watched those kids grow up. Yeah. Uh, Dan is one of the sons. He's, uh-huh. in, he's in Argentina right now yeah. hanging out with – John Eckler. No kidding. Well, Kiki's still in Mexico. Kiki's in Mexico, coming back to work <laughs> wow. for us this yeah. summer. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, they're growing. And, huh. and, and they're was, just good people. What a story. Just That's hearts cool. of gold. So. So, kind of God. full circle. Yeah. This episode is sponsored by Deli Fresh Design, a company that makes sustainable fly fishing gear in the heart of Denver, Colorado. Deli Fresh blends old waders and recycled sailcloth with Cordura canvas to make rugged, river tested gear such as fly wallets, slings, pet sling packs, and my favorite, beer koozies. I had a great chat with Ross at Deli Fresh and was blown away with it by his dedication to fly fishing and conservation. Here's a short clip of how Ross reduces waste with his personal actions and as a responsible company. But as a company, I'm trying to reduce my impact uh, by riding a bike or taking uh, the bus or shared uh, shared cars, stuff like that on uh, for commuting. And then, you know, yeah, when I go fishing, I, I'll get in a car, but I, I try to go with other people and 
And so I think there's things that as consumers that we can do on a daily basis. My own mentality of doing those things on a daily basis, like driving or riding a bike, uh, and then trying to see what uh, what materials I can use that reduce waste or what I'm trying to do as a person and as a company. Pretty good stuff, right? Let's support a great company doing business the right way. All of DFD's gear will help you spend more time casting and less time juggling your stuff. To see these products, go follow them on Instagram where you can see their latest designs. Find out more, visit delifreshdesign.com. What do you think is the take home from that whole story? I mean, it seems like that you were just in the right place at the right time, yeah. but I guess when doors open, yeah, you you can yeah. either walk through them or yep. walk away from That's them. Right. And we mm-hmm. walked through them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Not knowing where they led. Yeah. You know, we just opportunities yeah. that we that, took advantage it's of. It's funny. I, um, I interviewed Oliver White and recently came out and he was telling the story about he has a lodge in the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. And he, it was kind of a similar story, how he, the similar deal, he was in this right place and this guy came out of nowhere and basically said, um, do you want to work for my hedge fund in New York? Mm-hmm. Out of nowhere. And he just, he did it. He didn't think about it. He was like, okay, he did it. And yeah. because of that, that guy taught him a lot about business and mm-hmm. all this stuff. So it was like the best decision he ever made. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, that's a great, t- that's the great message yeah. is don't be afraid to just take a chance and, yeah. and go for it. Because just, you, just now, how long has it been since that time that you bought the business? How we bought it in 2003. Yeah. So 15, well, 16, 16 years. 16 years. 16 years. Wow. And we, 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 we said we were going to sell it in 10 That's years. That's right. So what yeah. happened there? Well, we, we didn't, didn't know. <laughs> we, we are didn't you still, so now are you going to sell it still in another 10 years? Or yeah. 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 10 more years we'll sell yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So what do you think? So uh, John Eklund? Yeah, he was the person oh, yeah. you bought it from. What he is, started at Little Creek Outfitters in 1983. Oh, in 83. Mm-hmm. 83. And where did he start? What river was his first river? Grand Ron. Grand Ron, yeah. John Day. Those are, see, he used to go and work for Patty Riley in Argentina. Mm-hmm. And Patty Riley, like, invented fly fishing in Argentina. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, she was, like, the first American to go down and start the guide yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. She's just, like, a legend oh, wow. in our Amazing, like, amazing yeah. woman. And, gotcha. and John used to, like, I think the story of how Little Creek got its name was John would go down there. And he would fish this little lake on his days off with this old Argentinian. And the little Argentinian would go, every time John would catch a fish, he'd go, how do you like my little lake? And John would go, I love your little lake, yeah. man. And John would catch another fish. And the Argentinian would go, how do you like my little lake? He'd go, I love it. And then John invited him up here. And they went fishing on you know, the John Day. Yeah. And oh, they'd, wow. catch, they'd catch a bass. And John would go, how do you like my little creek? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Old Argentinian, I love your little creek. Yeah. And so John named his outfit Little Creek oh, Outfitters. There you go. Yeah. From that, yeah, that's cool. What What do you think is the one thing you, uh, the, the biggest thing you learned from John? Any anything that sticks to you? Well, um, <laughs> pay your guys on time. Yeah, have provide food for your crew. Because you have, you like, have guys these are the things yeah. I didn't get. Felt like I didn't like yeah. he never learned to spell my name on the paycheck. You know, it's no like kidding. Marty Sherman, really? you, know, you know, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and it's like uh, oh. you know, pay your guys, have good. F- he had great yeah. food. Yeah, you know, but there wasn't always enough for the crew. So where did the great you know? food come from? Who was making the great food? He, 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 is this so on your trips? Are you yeah. making? Cooking, mm-hmm. you're doing everything. Yeah, well, setting up tents. We 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 have a gear boater. Oh, you have a gear boater. Yes. So you yeah. have somebody yeah. to help and set yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, and well, the gear boater, I should say, runs the program. Yeah. <laughs> the, His name's Rob. Yeah, Rob, okay. who's just phenomenal. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. Really yeah we, we've had we 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 get we have such a solid crew. Yeah. So Rob people. comes down, mm-hmm. gear boat, sets up yeah. camp ahead of time. Mm-hmm. So when you get there, yeah, everything's good to go. And yeah. does he cook too? Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. So he does everything. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah Rob huge. comes from a background of outfitting great rivers, great places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He wow. spent seven, eight years on the middle fork of the salmon. Mm-hmm. Used to be a Helfrich guide on the rug. He's a really great guy. That's yeah. cool. So he's high quality. Human. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. cool. Now, okay, so th- that was a good story, by the way. That, that's cool. And Marty so, tells great stories. Yeah, no, that's, that's all. I mean, because I remember, you know, I've heard about the, your business mm-hmm. and I never really made a connection, but that's the cool thing. Now I have a kind of the, the story. So the spade casting, you jumped right into it. You Did you start single hand casting or did you also start right in spade? Yeah, so I was single hand casting for a couple of years. But again, it was just a, it was a part-time thing. It wasn't my passion because of snowboarding. Yeah. And I moved up to Alaska. And, uh, that's and what where were I, you doing? Moved up there to? 
to guy? snowboard. Oh, to snowboard. So again, wow. I was following the ski areas Jeez. and the best snow. Okay. So I, I moved to Girdwood, but I was also commercial fishing. I started commercial fishing on crab boats. And so that brought me up to Alaska as well. Yeah. And, um, but I, I, I wanted to, I, again, fishing was just still just a part-time recreational thing. And I went to a garage sale, bought my first rod. It was a Shakespeare with a Fenwick reel. And I would go out to the Kenai and trout fish, you know, during yeah. the off season. And, um, and then in 2001, when I saw Marty spay cast was when I was, I became intrigued by spay casting. Gotcha. And then, and, and then I, I started, started, started dabbling in that. And, uh, it just, it just, you know, got a hold of my heart and I just love it. And, yeah. uh, so I've, I just, uh, what, what was the, what was the transition from single hand to spay? What was that like for you? Did you, did you pick it up? Well, it's funny why I, so I, yeah, in 2002, really when I started spay casting and I caught my first steelhead, I was hooked and all I wanted to do was spay cast. And even though I would guide bass trips in the summer, right. so I would guide bass trips and, yeah. and we would switch to single hand casting for, yeah. for, um, you know, two months, but I always just wanted to go back yeah. to spay casting. And are you fishing out of the and, boat? When you're doing the the bass, or it's all yeah, boat. yeah, so it's fishing, all, it's all boat. so so I, I yeah, all boat okay. with the bass fishing with a single hand, yeah. and then uh, then steelhead fishing. We're not fishing out of a boat. Yeah. We get out and yeah. walk and wade the runs. And um, it's funny, I became a better spay caster because I was spending more time with that, and that's that's really what I wanted to do. And I would go back to single hand casting. In fact, the first um, I went on a trip to Louisiana to go red fishing oh, nice. and uh, that was the first time really saltwater fishing yeah. and I was trying to cast this, you know, eight weight oh, yeah. and I sucked. Yeah. Like, I'm like, Just this heavy. is terrible. Yeah. I couldn't do it. Right. And I realized, whoa, you know, I need to get a little bit better at this. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so Just I, single, so, single yeah, hand yeah, hand. single yeah. hand casting. Yeah. And, uh, and so I ended up eventually taking a lesson with like Tim Ray Jeff oh, no kidding. and Catherine Hart oh, wow. and, and they, and they ended up teaching me a lot. Yeah. Um, but it's, I have a hard time with single hand casting because I'm left-handed right. dominant left-handed and I yep. broke this arm three times skateboarding. Jeez. And so I, and I never knew it until Tim pointed it out that as I come back, my, my hand naturally hooks behind my head. Oh yeah. So and so, your, your, and so it throws yeah, off my, uh, my of, single hand loop. Yeah. Um, and so, um, because I can't, I have a hard time flattening this left hand. And so single hand or spay casting is just a lot easier on my body. Oh. Um, I, I mean, I single or spay casting and it's just easier on my body, easier yeah. on my shoulders. Uh, and I, I just, I love it. Yeah. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. That's the cool thing about the spay is that you know, I've done a lot of single handed. I know what you mean. You got an eight weight rod out there and you're trying to cast as far as you can. Mm -hmm. You're getting tired. It's feeling heavy. It's just not a lot of fun. That's the, the spade cast is so much fun because it's anybody so can fun. grab you do somewhat. Actually, you don't even have to be a great, you know, spade caster mm -hmm. to shoot the line a pretty far distance. I mean, that's kind of how I've been able to do it. I, I'm not a great spade caster, but I can cover lots of water because mm -hmm. it's just a big, you know. It takes it just takes a lot of practice yeah. and uh, takes practice, but you got to let the rod do the work. And a lot of people tend to, um, when they come out and start learning, they, you know, they, they want to do the work. They want to force the rod. Yeah. You can't force a two handed rod. You can't force no, a single hand. No. You know, you gotta, you, you know, you gotta learn the proper cast and it's letting the rod load. And, um, so what was your, you know, from that to this spay around the championship, I mean, a lot of practice, but uh, what does it take to become, you know, at that level? I mean, besides the practice, what gosh, else? just, just dedication. And I think a little bit of, uh, um, so I, I, I come from a kind of a competitive background, but also being raised with three other sisters. Oh, so yeah. I, you know, we, we were, were you, always, were you, were you the, Oldest? Uh, no, second to the oldest. Second to oldest. So, okay. so definitely there was, you know, a little competition there. Yeah. But, uh, and then I, in snowboarding, I, I competed. I competed in, um, I was uh, actually at, at the Red Bull Extreme no competition. Kidding. Wow. That was one of the first um, big mountain competitions. What year and was that? I can't even remember. Yeah. 90. Because there's probably, there's probably some videos out there, right, of that stuff? Yeah, there, there's, I've never found a video, just an article. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, it, I mean, be, 
So I, I really kind of, I, I thrived off competition. Yeah. I just, I, I like how it pushes you to that next level yeah. and it challenges you, it challenges, yeah. you know, it challenges your ability and it, right. it just makes you get better, but it's also feeding off the other competitors. Yeah. You know, that's, um, so yeah, that's casting. What about competitive, uh, fishing, you know, USA team USA. Oh, well, you think well, that would be something you would be into? I actually, so part of me, yeah, I, I like the bass, competitive bass fishing. I think. Oh, right. Be, you mean like. I just, think that would be. Just gear fishing, the competitive. Well, if they ever had, had like for, fly fishing, yeah. I'd, I, I would, yeah. I would, I'd want to do that. Yeah. I've thought about going to Florida and entering some of those competitions. Sure. But, but you know, I'm like, well, I'm not a tarpon fisherman, but heck, why not? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. it's just getting out there and having fun. Yeah. And it's the camaraderie. Yeah, and, of, the, and yeah, but the competition that is something you enjoy, and you've yeah. been to the, the top level. I mean, in the skateboarding, I mean, you've done all these extreme sports. Mm -hmm. Fishing isn't quite as extreme of a sport. What, what do you think is the reason? Well, I I, I think just age. Well, yeah. right, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, just, yeah, you can't just, you can't do a uh, you can't do a half pipe like you used to. It's, yeah, it's. Oddly but, similar, though. but but oh, really? it is very oddly similar. To, to what? Oddly similar well, to lifestyle. To yeah. Oh, to like the, the, the lifestyle. The, just sleeping in the dirt, chasing yeah. hatches, mm -hmm. chasing that's powder, right. chasing yeah. chasing skate spots. Yep. Chasing. That's right. You know the lifestyle is yeah. very similar. Very similar. And to say there's no adrenaline in fishing is crazy. And there is yeah. adrenaline. Yeah. yeah. And that's I now compare it, like again just big mountain riding and standing that well there's the soulfulness of it yeah that's right. that is very comparable yeah. and so standing yeah. on top of the mountain yeah. and, and looking down on a yeah. chute that's just powder right and just going just yeah, yeah savoring just in knowing that. that you could die and, potentially well but it's not necessarily <laughs> that it's just looking around and being yeah. a part of nature and and just knowing that there's just something in front of you to look yeah. forward to and catching a steelhead it's like standing in the water cap and and just being a part of that process yeah. is it's a skill it, sport it's just yeah it takes but, skill and there's to, a, to cast a double-handed rod and there's you, a lot of if you, soul. If you don't think so, hand the one yeah. to a beginner with no instructions exactly. and watch them. Because, yeah. because right. it is not easy. Yeah. It yeah. is not easy to learn to spay cast. It's not easy to get good at it. Yeah. It's not easy. It's it's not easy to go from being pretty good at it yeah. to really good right. at it. It's yeah. not easy. Like no. you hit these plateaus yeah. and it, you get stuck on these plateaus. Right. You know, one of the things that sticks people is, you know, they they get muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Yeah. Until it's not. Right. Yeah. Because it becomes bad. Yeah. Because you need to learn to break muscle memory to get to the next plateau. That's right. Because you got to do something different. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that happens is, you know, as an instructor, we tell people slow down, go smooth, take your time, slow down. And then they they want to cast far and you can't slow down no. anymore. You have right. to give it some power. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so it's yeah. a little bit hypocritical. It's like, yeah, you know, slow down until you need to speed up or. And then yeah. getting to that that next level yeah. is hard. Yeah. And so where the comparison to snowboarding or skateboarding comes, it's like there's a tremendous amount of progression that mm -hmm. happens. And that's why we love snowboarding so much. Yeah. It's like, look, we got better. That's right. Oh, look, we're getting better yeah. again. And then you're getting to another plateau yeah. and you're, you're stepping up to this levels of like getting really good at snowboarding or skateboarding yeah. or fly fishing. Yeah. And, and when you said age – that's that's true in skateboarding and snowboarding. It's like eventually you stop getting better. Yeah. Oh, and it yeah. doesn't become as fun. No. It's not fun getting right. worse at there anything. Go. Yeah. But fly fishing, I never see the opportunity to stop getting better. No. So mm -hmm. you are you think you feel like you're still improving? Yeah. Yeah, always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there yeah, yeah. You're always improving. It might not There's always be, something to learn. Yeah. They might yeah. not be casting. Yeah. But steelheading the rivers change. Yeah, the yeah. gravel bar shift. That's right. The floods change the log jams. It's like, you know, you got to relearn rivers. You got to relearn new spots. You got to you got to struggle through slow fishing or hard fishing. And steelheading is hard, especially with the swan fly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, there's there's little things that you can always go into to reinvent yourself a little bit. Like from me, you know, just like. Deciding one day she wanted to be a distant spay casting competitor at a world champion level. It's yeah. like the you know, and now what's next? Well what's next is a kids camp. Oh yeah. You know, what's yeah. next for me was building a bamboo rod. Right. Like 
Yeah, that's right. I didn't know how to do that yeah. five years ago, and mm-hmm. I started getting interested in it. Yeah. And, and I've gone through this whole process to a point where I'm, I can build one on my own yeah. now. Yeah. And it took a lot of mentorship and learning. It took a lot of – but it's like those are the little things that you can always get better at is diversification. You know, mm-hmm. build a bamboo rod. Yeah. You know, build a wood drip boat. No do, Have you done that? No, but no. We, I'm excited about the yeah. one we are recent owners of. Oh, right. Yeah. So you have a, a clack craft out there. What are your other boats? So you have a wood boat? Or? Yeah. So we have a Ray's River Dory. Oh, yeah, Ray's, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's got yeah. it's cool history. It used to be a Rogue River boat. Uh-huh. Uh, but it was a Denny Hewson boat. It was a legend Rogue River guy. Okay. And Ray, Ray's boats are really cool boats. Yeah. And it's it's a really neat boat. Yeah. And then, mm-hmm. um, so we have a 1652 Special Rogue is what it's called. No kidding. And then um, we also have a 16-foot double winder aluminum boat that was built by the Briggs Boat Shop, the Rogue River Boat Shop. Oh, and what so, does double winder mean? Double winder is like pointy on oh, both pointy ends. Oh, pointy on both ends. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And why, yeah. why, why, why the pointy on both ends? Well, this is kind of a design that was developed by Martin Linton. And so if you know who Martin Linton is, Martin Linton's like the godfather of running – Dory's down the Grand Canyon. Oh yeah, he yeah he's like. That's right. There's a video. Go check it out yeah. if you get a chance. Okay. Just search, yeah. search Martin's boat. Cool. Well, this mm-hmm. is one of Martin's boats. Like yeah. this is one of his designs that came out of the Rogue River gotcha. Brig Shop. And most of those boats were made out of wood, but this is an aluminum one, and it's just got cool shape, cool mm-hmm. flare to it. It doesn't That's take cool. waves in on so big it, water. Well, it's awesome it's intended for, for, for big water. Yeah, yeah. Big And water. that's, you know, with fishing, I'd say that's, for me, it's the next level is being a better boatsman. Yeah. And and that's, I, I love being on the water. And, yeah. and running rivers is such a challenge. Yeah. And water humbles me. And so, yeah. you know, being able to, to row bigger white water is like another skill in itself and for me that's like the next level and and it's been really fun we've been you know uh, floating the rogue i keep putting it through like the wild and scenic yeah so we've done that now a couple times the oahe river uh, river that i just got a permit on so the oahe has isn't that the one has like killer fang and or it may not kill Mm -hmm. it isn't there a couple you have to portage on the oahe well yeah up in the upper part so the the section that we'll be running it's it's about 50 miles and there's yeah yeah, it's a lot of consecutive class you know threes and couple fours and twos um and uh, my, a lot of challenging rapids there, and the Rogue is really great. And all yeah, these rivers are really there's great. So yeah. many rivers. Yeah, the Rogue is and, and I guess what we're getting to is there's a lot of layers. Yeah, there's there are. there's like so, a lot yeah, of layers. Yeah. It isn't yeah. just fishing. Yeah, you know, if it's this, not. you know, this is our lifestyle, yeah. and it's. I mean, there's so much more. Do you think you're, you know, you're both guiding and running this business? Do you do you see that changing anytime soon? As far as getting out of the guiding, maybe. No. doing other things Is i'm it, hoping to retire yeah at 64 65 yeah. yeah and you and you'd be happy if you just guided yeah the whole time yeah i mean we're we're planning we're trying to plan retirement yeah like we <laughs> right. have yeah iras and a financial advisor at a yeah. bank you know right, where we right. go in and we and sit down yeah. and we're, we're just getting going on yep. this it's like, just recent that's right yeah, <laughs> it's it's like, like, it's it's like we gotta go. we gotta get it together we yeah. gotta figure out how to retire because right. Most of the guys I know don't, and and, and I, um, yeah. and again I've talked to. I think this is episode uh, seventy five, so I've done seventy five of these mm-hmm. things, and I've talked to a bunch of people, and this has come up occasionally, and uh, you know, I, and some of them, yeah, and some of the people, <coughs> people said, you know, that, I mean, there was one plan where it was like he was going to get a camper and just go around and do the show circuit during that season, and then live in Mexico during the off season, mm-hmm. you know. So there's like. A bunch of different ways you can do it. it. It's mm-hmm. such a very, it's a very romantic lifestyle. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, and for a family to do it, we're both, both, you know, people are guiding is, is challenging. Yeah. It's very challenging, but I would have, I, I don't want to do anything else. Yeah. You know, I just uh, resigned from a stable, great job with um a, with a nonprofit called the Theater of Roosevelt Conservation Partnership and fabulous organization and um and so that I could start working on this again full time because I went I want to be on the water more yeah. I want my daughter to see me 
you know, just getting outdoors. I want to, you know, have be able to influence her into appreciating this lifestyle more mm -hmm. and to follow her heart. Yep. So that's cool. Which is that's pretty much what you guys have done. You yeah. Your heart, your passion. Yeah, it, it's a it's a lot of work. It's yeah. not it's not easy. Yeah. You know, we've we've worked really really hard to get to where we're at. Right. And um, yeah, and uh, uh, a lot of people these days. There's a lot of people wanting to be guides and. Yep. And it is, it's really what, what do you tell those people when they ask you on social media or somewhere out there, like, do you have any, any tips for getting into this whole thing? Just, just work hard, yeah. you know, really work hard. Um, your reputation is everything. Yeah. Be honest. You know, you, you just got to be honest to people. Yeah. If a river's blown out, call them up, let them know the river's blown out. Yeah. You want to know my advice? You know? Yeah. Work for somebody else. Yeah. And work, that's yeah. well established. That's right. Mm-hmm. And communicate with them yeah. about taking over one day. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Because, because, is that a hint? Yeah. No, yeah. no, yeah. no maybe, but 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 no, I'm being honest about yeah. it. Like, I don't know how. I don't think we would have made it if we didn't buy an existing business. Yeah, it's to, tough. Be, to be fair, we can't guide on these rivers without buying in somebody's business that's because right. they're SRPs. Yeah, the they don't transfer. The, you can't just go get a permit. No. You have to buy some. You know, the permits on the John Day Grand, are those all specific to those rivers? It's yes. Not one, it's not one BOM permit for all of them. No. Yeah. no. And so each one has... So when you bought the business, you paid for, you got those per, those permits came with the business. They transferred the yeah. the, the permits over to our name exactly. based mm -hmm. on us buying the business. See, these permits aren't for sale. No. You can't sell No, you permits. can't even buy a permit right now no. if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. You can't buy a permit ever. It's like illegal. Oh. You can buy a business oh, though that they will transfer. Yeah, you can't buy the permit. So the only yeah. the only way that any of these younger guys can get yeah. a Deschutes business going is to yeah. buy somebody else's business. Or to work for somebody and then get eventually, like you said, work for somebody until they sell it or Yeah, mm -hmm. and so my advice is to work for an established yeah. outfitter and then try to find your way to to run the business. Yeah. You know, if you if you really want to make it, if you really want to do it for her. 30 years yeah. or 20 years if you really want to be a guy and if you only want to do it for a couple of years same advice yeah just go to work for exactly. somebody that's an effort are you, but trying to just do it on your own yeah. from scratch right. almost impossible yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. are you looking to uh find any guides to help out with you what we're you always are? looking yeah you are yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, okay. we, we have a busy calendar yeah and we're always yeah. looking for subcontractors some guides yep. so we're looking for guides that have their own guide license mm -hmm. we're looking for guides that have their own insurance and we're looking to hire them to work on trips with us. But we do have a solid crew of people yeah. that have been they come, com that, yeah. that have been coming back and doing trips with us for for quite a yeah quite a lot lot of years. Corey Corey Coffee's been coming on trips with us for probably eight nine years now. Mm. So nice. Yeah. Well, we are. I mean, we're. Definitely a good uh, hour and 20 or somewhere. I mean, yeah, we've yeah. been chatting here. I, I've got a few more questions. Another hour if you want. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I've got a few more. I have a little rapid fire round I usually do at the end. Yeah. But before I get into that, maybe we can just jump through a, a, a couple of these more of the, a few of the tips and then just some random stuff. So for, I always like to ask the uh, kind of the top two flies, top two tips, top two resources, things. Do you maybe on a few both want to just come together with maybe your top two steelhead flies for the John Day? Um, maybe think about maybe one each. Um, okay. Do you do you have one off the top of your head you want to share, or maybe it's just your go-to steelhead fly that you throw on there? You go ahead. <laughs> well, that's a hard question. Yeah. Well, I I, I can say I. Uh, um, did you say you go ahead and then interrupt me? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I was just trying to say that. <laughs> Am I going ahead? Go ahead. <laughs> so, I steelhead are a funny critter. Yeah. Right? And um, they'll eat anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, a lot of times, I have a new fly every year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just, like, kind of feel it out at the beginning of the year and something works. A new and fly that's kind of the same color and size and stuff no, that you've always like, are just are I mean, yeah. totally different. But, so, early season, I got to have a skater. Yeah. I love seeing a steelhead eat a surface fly, skated across. Yeah. So. And why early season? Well, because the water temperatures oh, yeah. are, are sufficient mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. So late season, you're not going to have as good of odds. You're not going to probably even fish a skater late season. Yeah. So you're going to fish a skater early season. Yeah. So i got to have a skater. Okay. And what would a skater pattern that somebody might find on Google and up? Yeah. Um, you know. Or, or, or anything you want to share. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, just the um, 
I've gotten to a point where I'm just down to one skater pattern, and I don't know what it's called, yeah. but it's got you know, some foam on it. It does. It's yeah. got deer hair, yeah. and it's it's just right. the, the typical. They're like, all kind of the same. Yeah, it's a. I mean, just a foam thing. Yeah. that's gonna wake it's up. It's really easy. You don't have to tie any special knots on it. Yeah. You just like tie a knot on it, yeah. throw it out there, and it skates. So if we on and your it, website, mm -hmm. and I haven't been there to it, but yeah. if I was to go there mm -hmm. and look at the the front page, I mean, is it more of a Kind of here's how you book your trips, or do you guys like blog and do all that stuff there? And do a little yeah, we stuff. did a blog for a lot of years, and it really was a beneficial thing to us. But it seemed like the culture of how people people interacted online changed a lot with Facebook and Instagram and yeah. that stuff. So we kind of like yeah. the blog was a lot of labor. Like yeah. we would we put a lot. So into you were it. writing, and but we haven't done that for yeah. years yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. But it's still out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just yeah. put a new post up okay, recently. Yeah. So you go oh, you did? Yeah, just to see if anybody noticed. Oh. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no one noticed. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody did. You never know. All oh. right. So, so a skater. And then do you have... So, well, yeah. I like um, green butt skunks. Yeah. So a green butt skunk. Mm -hmm. Not a skunk. No. This is so funny. Frank Moore, who I interviewed. Yeah. I'll put a link to the show notes to some of these things we're talking about. The Frank Moore was great in person, just like this. Yeah. Had him and Jeannie here doing mm -hmm. the same exact thing, yeah. which is pretty... Kind of cool. They're like about. heroes to us. Oh, heroes! I, this is yeah. great because I—you're actually the second couple. Yeah. But I asked Frank. I was kidding him. All right, what's your same thing? What's your favorite flight? And he, and he said a skunk. And I said a green butt skunk. And he got mad. He's like, <laughs> no, no. Yeah. He was like, no, not damn green butt skunk. Oh, no. Yeah. And he, and he explained how the guy that invented the green butt was also fish in okay. the north. And Dan invented, Callahan. Yeah, Dan Callahan, Callahan exactly invented it. Went, but the funny thing was, it's a short story. A long story short, I went up that night, put on a skunk. Caught my first North on the bus. Oh, that's so cool. awesome. But so green butt skunk. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just like it. It just seems to work. It used to be a muddler. And then, I don't know, muddlers just weren't catching steelhead. So I changed flies and yep. the green butt's been very effective. And just your traditional effective. green butt with uh, yeah, kind of yeah. low water, kind of sparse. Yeah, and I, I like the smaller the better. So yeah. like a size you know, nine, 10, yeah. like I like small, small. Yeah, really small, small flies small. on the John Day and the Deschutes. Um, that's, that's early se season when the water temperatures are, let's say in that 50, 55 oh, yeah. degree. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And can I get my second point? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. So here, here's a tip at the same time. Good. As the John Day water temps get colder in mid November, you are going to want to fish a leech. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to, get that thing down a little bit but the problem is is the water flows are so soft that you can't use a sink tip there uh -huh. so you want to use an intermediate a clear intermediate yep. sink tip gotcha because it's going to turn over on a skagit line mm -hmm. a leech really good okay so mm -hmm. what i like is oh what's uh i use like a different one every year yeah. like like i there's a fly yeah. called the silvanator Silvanator, okay. Silvanator yeah, was that. basically invented yeah. the silver, by the, Brian the silver Silvey. Hilton. Oh, okay. Not the Silver Hilton. Not mm -hmm. the Silver Hilton. The Silvanator. Silver, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a bunny leech with a, a bead head on it. Okay. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. A black bunny leech? Yeah, or a gray, or, or blue, 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 or blue or purple yeah. or, or a red. A red one works good okay. there. A black one works good there. A purple one. A purple with a pink head. A <laughs> yeah. black with an orange okay, head. So it all, yeah. okay. Just a leech that's going to basically get down a little mm -hmm. bit. Get down a little bit. And, and, and I used that for years on the John Day. And last year, I think I was using this, uh, uh, what's Brett's? Oh, Klamath Intruder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Klamath mm -hmm. Intruder was like my go to leech okay. last year. It's just a very small leech. Yep. That one was a little less weighted. Like how small, how long of a leech? Oh, it's Ooh. like an inch and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little small leech. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the silver netters aren't very yeah. long either. You can kind of, you can link up to that somehow, gotcha. I'm sure. But okay. So you're using that intermediate, and I know mm -hmm. when I talked to Simon Gosworth, I had him on, mm -hmm. and I think that was one of his things, was his favorite line that he loves is that little intermediate. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which, well, obviously Rio, but they all probably have them. And mm -hmm. he said that, you know, a lot of people just use their dry line, you know, mm -hmm. which I do too, but he said that intermediate line oh. he loves, especially on the I shoots love it too. too. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's, it's and great it just line. gets you a little bit below. Mm -hmm. Overlooked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tips. And you also have- Pun intended. Yeah, yeah, totally. Tips that you can use. It is a good- and you have a, a, a perspective on sinking lines, right? I think um, I think Tim was telling me about that. How you don't go too deep too often, right? You like to stay a little bit more. Can you speak to that a little bit about how you're? And I don't know if we're talking about winter fish. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Because most guys, when you think of winter, well, not most guys, but mm -hmm. some people think you know, get down those fish. They're cold. They're hunkered down. You got to get it right, kind of right there. But do you think you have to get it right there within a foot of those fish, or? 
Depends on the conditions. Okay, so if you're getting a, a, a sandy, I'm not sure how much the water temperature fluctuates. Uh, you're yeah. saying if it's a little warmer or a little clearer, you might be able to, those fish might go up a little further? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's complicated, right? Yeah. It's complicated because steelhead behavior is based on a lot of limiting factors. Okay. So temperature water, being temperature, water level, all these factors. Yeah. Let me just put it simple. If the water is high on the sandy, now all rivers are built differently, but the yeah. sandy, I'm talking about the sandy, right. I'm talking about yesterday. Okay. I'm talking about yeah. all winter long, yeah. February, January. On the sandy, when the water level's high. High oh, and off color? Yep. The water temperatures are warmer. Oh, yeah. Always. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so, and the fish are living in four to six feet of water, 15 feet off the bank. It's perfect. Huh. You do not need to be heavy in that four to six feet of water because it's soft water. Right. So you need to be able to swing all the way into where the fish are. Yeah. Based on that, if you're using too heavy, if you're using a heavy tip, you're hung up before you get to the fish. That's right. In my opinion. Yeah. Now, when the water's low and clear on the sandy, which it was most of all of February this year, and some yeah, of them, yeah. most of March too, probably. So yeah. when the water's really low and really clear, it's cold. It's, cold. it's always at its coldest. Yeah. And the fish are always deep, 10 to 15 feet oh, deep. Wow. So I use yeah. really heavy tips That's to get it. down into those yeah. fish when the water's low and clear. It's the opposite it of what is. people it's might think. It's kind of counterintuitive, yeah. But it makes sense it if does. you really think it about does. the behavior of the fish. Right. Mm -hmm. So high water, light tip. There you go. Low water, heavy tip. Which is so you're and you're not fishing the heavy water with a light tip. You're finding those kind of those little pill or the softer water on the fish. inside the where inside those fish scene. are laying in the heavy yeah. high flows. So you might be swinging around a big run, but yeah, you're fishing the inner inner yeah. inside. Gotcha. See, you see that heavy flows in those trenches on the sandy. Well, the fish don't want to sit out there on the heavy flows. No, they're going to be on the inside, yeah. nice soft That's water, right. That's right. and so. So the, the moral of the story is, is most of the fish that we catch on the sandy in the winter are on light tips. Yeah. That's Yesterday, cool. the water came up. It was beautiful. Yeah. We caught an unweighted fly on seven and a half feet of T10. No kidding. This is a light tip. Yeah. That's yeah. what we got to fish with. But in the summertime, it's um, we're, we're fishing floating lines. Yeah. It's yeah. all floating. Yeah. yeah. It's Even all floating. no intermediate? Or you, nope. Yeah. No. We just stick to floating from, yeah. from end of July all the way through... In middle of October, end of October, actually end of October. Yeah. And then I'm we go to those intermediate line. tips late yeah. oh, season, okay. John Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Cool. So yeah. So we got the we got the two flies. We got the two tips. I guess there's a couple of tips in there, um, and then two resources. Do you have any? Wait, do you have your second yeah. fly? Yeah. Yeah. No, what was your second? Well, fly? well, I, I said a muddler, and then yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 gotcha. Um, yeah. Do you have two resources that you would recommend if somebody wanted to learn about John Day, specifically steelhead fishing? You know, is there anything online? Is there books? Is there videos? Anything you, you know of that could help somebody? I recommend you go buy Sean Gallagher's book called <laughs> Wild Steelhead. I oh, yeah. do. It's yeah. got a whole chapter yeah, that, that we talked about the John Day in yeah. it. So yeah. that's a good resource. Oh, cool. It's kind oh, of nice. That's a neat one. But online, I don't know that there's anything yeah. that, like, that I would recommend. Yeah, because the John well, Day isn't a very the, there is there is a resource. The BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, uh -huh. Prineville District, yeah. uh, they have John Day maps, and oh, those yeah. maps are going to give you access points and where where That's public right. land is and where private Perfect. land is, and Perfect. so and it, and it lists history and talks a little bit about fishing and such. But that would be a good resource. Okay, there's yeah. a lot of private land on the John Day that you need to be aware of. I use Onyx maps. You know, oh, Onyx Maps. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. it's a hunting app oh, yeah. that hunting app, yeah. tells yeah. you where if you're standing on Private public land. Or public yeah, land. yeah. That's a good and thing. that that's a good resource. Another good resource is dam counts coming up. Mm -hmm. The Bonneville Dam. What are good John Day? Dam. What are good counts to know? I guess it's coming over the. Well, is the John Day comes in below or above the John Day? Dam. Just above. Yeah. So so you know. So if you look at John Day counts, yeah. what what's a good count to know on John Day? I don't know. I just watch it just out of curiosity. Yeah. I don't so know. So it's not because you can look at the Dalles, yeah. Bonneville, and really be like, okay, you can get a feel for what's going to the Deschutes. See, but the problem is, is the majority of the run crosses over the Bonneville, the Dalles Dam, then the John Day Dam months ahead of when we fish oh, it. Oh, yeah. when we fish it. So those fish yeah. come into the John Day pool. Yeah. 
they go and there's some a lot of data based on pit tags sure where half the run goes mm-hmm. up above it keeps going it keeps going, going. To yeah. and, snake and then half that right. run comes back yeah mm-hmm. so oh wow, yeah. and then a lot of fish sit in a closed section of the john day arm where they just sit and wait for the water to come up and the john day's kind of quite a bit different than the shoes too because you think of the Chus as this cold water re- refuge area you yeah. know, where fish are turning into the lower river. Yeah. John Day doesn't really have that, right? That time of year, they're coming in the yeah, summer, so it's, it's warm. There's yeah. some upwelling and yeah. there's some, some sanctuary yeah. water on the John Day. Yeah. Wherever yeah. there's a spring coming in. So they, there's okay. little springs and, yeah. and fish, if they're coming in early, they'll hang out they're at those there. springs. Yeah. We see um, still we, in the John Day in June. Yeah, and we've yeah, also found right. seen dead steelhead oh, yeah. in July. In, yeah. in July, sure. yeah. that basically get trapped in that warm water, <laughs> oh, yeah. and yeah. if they don't make it to a spring, then so probably the most important gone. resource would be listening to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. and watching water levels. So USGS yeah. sites. Mm-hmm. You, you know, we watch the one at Service Creek, and we mm-hmm. watch the one at McDonald Ferry, mm-hmm. and those will really teach you a lot about how gradual that river is because it takes a lot of days sometimes mm-hmm. from whatever event happens at service creek to travel that hundred and whatever oh, miles it miles, is right. to mcdonald ferry oh, wow. and so mm-hmm. it gives you some perspective of like how long it takes that water if there's a bump in water at service creek well if it's at five thousand cfs in the spring it doesn't take long yeah to get down to mcdonald ferry but at 200 cfs it might take two weeks gotcha great okay and, and you're also, in the John Day, going back to the November fishing, it's going to be a little, it could be pretty nasty over there, right? You might get yeah. some cold. Oh, yeah. And are you camping or is this like day tripping over there? I'm. We're, we're doing both. Yeah. yeah. So day, day trips and multi-day yeah. trips. I guess November can also be nice. I mean, it doesn't. I, it's usually, the canyon is about 10 degrees warmer, yeah. I've discovered over the years. Oh, yeah. Then um, if you're. On top. If, yeah, mm-hmm. then on top. Yeah. So we'll pay attention to like the Condon yeah. weather station. And uh, and then and take tip, ten degrees and then, off. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. canyons okay. usually or rise at ten yeah. degrees for the canyon. Right. And are you during that time? And you are usually floating during those. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I've uh, I've got a little bit of rap. You want to jump to this rapid fire round real quick? Sure. Just a few uh, some random some random questions here. So the first one I've been doing this little thing a little bit on on music, and this is kind of interesting because I've been I can't remember when I started doing this, but I started asking people, "What's your favorite? Maybe band or." Just music type, and then throwing in a link in the show notes of a uh, you know video. So, so do you guys have any? I'm not sure. Do you have a favorite band or music type? So of music you recently, to? Ella King. Ella King. Yes. Okay. Oh, oh but, but but I've been listen, listening to her a lot. All right. All right. But or 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 uh, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Really? Is Dolly Parton still going? Like, yeah, I is think she still so, putting yeah. music out there? Yeah. Okay. Dolly Parton. Are you the same or? No, you, well, way different. No. All right. <laughs> 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 I'm so annoyed by that music. <laughs> <laughs> what if you had to explain from your perspective what what's what's that type of music? What is it? Is it pop pop or what? what I don't know. Ella King yeah. is pop. It's pop, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's modern. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. hits hits one. Yeah, top forties, yeah. top forty. All right, all right. Yeah, Dolly Parton. I, is I, like, I listen to I so Dolly. much. Yeah. I mean, punk rock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. it's interesting. I'll, be, I'll check it out. It'll be good to hear. I listen yeah. to podcasts and Super Suckers. Super Oh, Super oh, and, suckers, I, yeah. and I love the Super Suckers, yeah. too. Yeah, and they're kind of, uh, what are they, like an alt-rock a sort p- of? Uh, a punk rock. Yeah. Punk you know, rock country. Yeah, country. Punk, exactly. So. Kind of like the... Uh, we actually just saw them a couple months ago. They, oh, they're they, grunge they, country. They, they, grunge country. Like, uh, not know, know, Wilco and some of those bands are kind of, I guess, Wilco's They're fun. They're the original rock and roll band. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no, they're awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit, I guess we talked a lot about the sports, because I've been asking some of the, you know my guests about what sports they do. So you, the snowboarding, I mean, that... We're, those were your main yeah. things. And was there anything else in throughout your life that you kind of did that were big sports or that was, I'm just a trailblazers fan. Yeah. Oh, basketball. So basketball. And yeah. I, I'm yeah. a Timbers fan okay. these days. Yep. Did you ever play soccer? Never played it. I but our daughter did and that got her into it. Oh, no yeah. kidding. Okay. Well, how, did yeah. you ever play basketball? Oh yeah. But in, you know, 77, yeah. Portland won the championship. That's right. And I was just like a little boy yeah. and super impressionable. And yeah, I had yeah. like, Maurice yeah. Cheeks posters on my right. wall. Who you was know? your favorite? Was he your favorite player? Maurice? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Probably later was like yeah. Jimmy Paxson. That's right. 
Well, Clyde Drexler. Bill right? Walton. Actually, I had this on the from the very beginning. The, the yeah. hippies, which actually we might have talked on the. Yeah, I think you mentioned the hippies, but speaking of Bill, Walton. exactly Bill Walton, which is classic. But uh, well, let, let me see if I have some time because I had a hippie question for you. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, so yeah, Bill Walton is great. But the Blazers. So I guess we did cover the sports a little bit. So you get off the river. What's your favorite? Um, your go-to drink that you're going to have? Oh, um, my go-to drink. These days, I'm, I, I I like Hendrix uh, gin. Okay, gin. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just a, is that not a gin and tonic? Gin soda water. Gin soda. Okay. But I mean, I'm not having them every day. Sure. Oh yeah. But, but just that too, if you. Have. But yeah. Okay. It's refreshing. Then, how about you? Iced tea. Iced tea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's my go-to drink. Yep. So no alcohol. You, I, I I drink on vacation, so I'm, yeah. Oh. You know, it's not like I don't have, but I no, I don't. Yeah. I'm not a beer drinker. Yeah. I'm no not, beer. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. When I had a cold, I was having some uh, hot whiskey toddies. sour hot toddies. Oh, yeah. There <laughs> yeah. you go. Right. But, you know, just not uh, – I'm not a day-to-day -day, – like, I get off the river, I don't have a drink. Yeah. yeah. Like, I guide, I don't drink while I guide. Yep. Like, yeah. we do the camp right. trips, I don't drink. Yeah. It's just uh, – I don't know. Like, I like feeling good. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's the mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, alcohol definitely is not your uh, natural – It takes away – it gives you happiness. Yep. For today, it takes away from tomorrow's happiness. Exactly. Is what it feels like. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, so we were talking a little bit about bamboo, and I think we're actually going to have to hold that whole conversation until the next one. Great. The next interview. So I'll, if we can get you back on sometime. I'm then. no yeah. expert yeah. at it. So by, maybe by then, it. you'll be an expert. I doubt it. All right. <laughs> um, but do you have a you know raw and real line sort of talking about companies that you guys use? I mean, we were talking about the coast. Uh, you got, you're sponsored by some Companies mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah, know? we're we're competitors. So Mia is Smith, Smith. and I'm Costa. <laughs> okay. And are they both into? Yeah, well, Costa. Yeah, they're both big time fly fishing. Mm -hmm. Do a lot of fly fishing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I Smith. I I mean, growing up snowboarding, right? I wore Smith goggles. Yeah. So I've right. always been a fan. Do they make is Smith the big fly fishing? Do they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, yeah. they make a polarized glasses okay. forever. Mm -hmm. forever. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And Costa is just a they're huge fishing company to yeah. the core in right. Florida. It's right. been designing okay. great sunglasses forever, and so we love. We have relationships with both those companies, yeah. and and so. What about your um, uh, rod real lines? Do you have any companies you use? Airflow? Airflow, okay. Mm -hmm. Echo, Echo, yeah. yep, and uh, and then reels. Saracion. Well, we, uh, we, you have, a bunch we, of, we have a lot of different reels. Yeah, I was going to say um, downstairs if I took a picture of your, but, uh, your shop, it's yeah. Yeah, pretty crazy. We're a big yeah. Joe Saracion fan. Okay, but so all right. yeah. cool. his reels are like our favorite. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. All right. And then I just got one from my friend Mark Schamberg. He makes reels. Now it's a, it's a beauty. Oh, cool. So, all right. Yeah. Are there a lot of people out there making just like I'm not, I don't know all these names, but people are just like, okay, I'm just going to make a reel. I have some background in the There's camp. not a lot. There's okay. not a lot. So these the things you're talking about here, these are people that have mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, Shamberg's a bench made reel made mm -hmm. in a shop, yep. that, machine mm -hmm. shop. And, gotcha. You know, Joe makes his reels right there in Sandy, Oregon. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's kind okay. of a, him and Dolores, they're just yeah have a little a little real shop that yep. um, that's cool makes they're some of the fantastic. nicest reels yeah. in the world. No kidding. And then um, what makes a nice what's the difference between the nicest reel in the world versus <laughs> because there are companies out there. I mean, lots of them that are making you know there's stuff come over from overseas. Yeah, tons of reels that probably work great. Yeah, yeah. What's the difference? That Joe actually he's, polishes. Yeah. Joe actually yeah. hand. You know, he puts. He makes right. his screws. Yeah. yeah, He doesn't buy screws sure. from somebody. Yeah, it's and there's just like, everything is made there in the shop, and every reel is inspected by Joe. Yeah, I mean, it's he puts yep. so much work and just passion into yeah. every little piece. Yeah. And right. and you can you know it's again As coming back to, to soul of the soul of the sport. Yeah. When I when I'm fishing a Joe reel or Cercion, like. It just, it feels right. Yeah, that's right. it. And you got a fish that's screaming. When I first yeah. met Joe, I really wanted one of his reels. Couldn't afford one of his yeah. reels. They're not cheap, yeah. and, and but they're worth it. And I just remember asking him, like, hey, if you ever have any seconds. Yeah. And he looked at me and he goes, I don't have seconds. No, you know, no like, kidding. Yeah, that's because cool. he controls every step of the process. Yeah. And and there's just no, there's, it's not like he goes, oh, the screw's messed yeah. up I'll put it on there anyway right. no he makes another screw you know? wow. so there's no seconds so what if you were to buy one right now what would you pay for a real 1200 1200 bucks yeah for, for a one of his. there yeah. you go yeah. so one of my prize reels is a um 
is an Alta. Oh, okay. uh, it's a four and three quarters. There's only thirty of them, and there's only no thirty kidding. of them. And yeah. it was he made it for me uh, for my for my competition. That, that was the real. Well, there was one yeah. downstairs we looked at. Yeah. yeah so the really the big one. So that uh, the last couple of years that I uh, <coughs> that I won Spay Rama, it was with that. Reel. Oh no, kidding! Mm -hmm. And that's a, the one we looked oh, at. Oh, it's a big reel. It's big. A, ma a massive. It's reel. big. And we got a <laughs> shout out to Gary Anderson. Oh, yeah. I yes. love Gary's yep. rods. Mm -hmm. Do you know his rods? I've heard, yeah, yeah, I know the name. Yeah, and Gary is great, and his rods are great, and we love Gary, and he's just a good mm -hmm. friend. You know, we love Echo and Ray Jeff yeah. Sports. Yeah. Tim, Tim so and on. Catherine. Are well, and Echo is a great example of the because yeah. you hear the you know you can't find a bad rod these days, and right. Echo is a great example of you know they're not twelve hundred dollars. They're more no. on they're on the other end. Yeah. But they're maybe one of the toughest rods out mm -hmm. there. I will guide and fish their lowest end yeah. rods and be completely satisfied exactly. with their performance, mm -hmm. yep. their durability. You know, I fish yeah. their high end rods and they're they're all super good. Like all good. The, you know, Tim knows what he's doing with yeah. designing rods. Yeah, really he's good. Yeah, yeah he's been he's, he's been there. Yeah. And so who else? Who are we forgetting? Sims. Mm. Oh, yeah, Sims, that's <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Not yeah. to forget Sims, yeah. but Sims. Yeah. Is we, really wonderful. Yeah. Their waiters are wonderful. Yeah. They really treat us yeah. really good. We have some relationships with with well, people at lot. Sims that yeah. are just dear friends of ours, mm -hmm. and so um, a lot of good people. I wish I could make it out to family. Montana to visit them more. Sims makes good mm -hmm. stuff, and uh, thankfully some of them come out and visit us here yeah. and go steelhead with us. So we right. love those guys, and they're really really good friends of ours. So mm -hmm. cool. Sims is great. Well, that is about all I have. I um, just before I let you go in the next six to twelve months, is there anything new we can expect from you guys coming out? Maybe something. Well, um, I'd like to mention the the a book that I'm going to be in called Fifty Women oh, yeah. Who Fish. Yeah, and uh, pretty exciting. It was just released uh, really today. Yeah, uh, written by a wonderful guy out of Florida, Steve Cantor. And uh, and published by Tom Perra. Yep, perfect. Robert Press. Yeah, I'll put a link to the show yeah. notes for that book. And yeah, good. And then if uh, and again going back to if they want to find you, LittleCreekOutfitters dot com is the best place if they want to have questions mm -hmm. or book a trip or something like that. Definitely, always happy to answer questions about spay casting. I yep. love talking about it. Well, we love. didn't get into the spay. The first thirty episodes of this show were all, well, thirty five were all steelhead. Yeah, we talked right. a lot about spay. Yeah, it was pretty much all. So I talked a lot about it, but um, yeah, there's always questions. I mean, it is a struggle in the, the lines and there's just, and I look downstairs, you had, I mean, I don't know how many different lines you have sitting down <laughs> there. Crazy. For people just getting in, it's a crazy, it's confusing and stuff. We like try that. to keep it simple. Yeah. Keep it simple. So if you have, if you have to leave it us, if you have to keep it simple, how do you keep it simple to somebody that just wants to get a, a set up and go, what would you recommend? For, uh, Gosh, I, you know, is it? I mean, well, I guess yeah. winter steelhead would be the harder thing to keep it simple. But. Well, no, it's very simple. So um, for a beginner that's just getting into it and buying their first rod, yeah. I recommend you go out and buy an Echo Swing. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a 249 bucks right. for a rod that, in my opinion, I can do the same things with yeah. that as I can. Like a 12 and a half foot. A 13 foot 7 weight is probably going to do everything yep. for you. It's yep. going to do winter fishing. It's going to do summer fishing. Mm -hmm. okay. You're going to need two lines. You're going to need a Scandi line and a Skagit yeah. line. It's as simple as that. The Skagit right. lines are going to throw sink tips. The Scandi lines are going to throw floaters. Yeah. You want your Scandi line to be 30 grains lighter than your Skagit line. There's a reason for it. The reason is the Scandi lines are load your rod with the speed of yeah. the line, and the Skagit rods load your rod with the weight of the line. Right. And so those two things make the difference in grain weight. So that's just keeping it simple. Yeah. But – um. You need to throw sink tips for winter fish. You need to throw floating lines for summer fish. If you're just getting into it, a simple Echo Rod, Airflow Skagit line, mm -hmm. an Airflow Scandi line. You need some sink tips for the Skagit line. You need some poly leaders yep. or just floating leaders right. for the Scandi. And you're ready to go. It's yeah. simple. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's can be complicated. Right. You can make it complicated. If, if you just like try to like interpret every little thing yeah but all you need to do is have that's right a sink tip rod yeah that's what people and a do floating line rod and yeah. they could both be the same rod yeah because loop to loop connections right. make it easy to be versatile yeah yeah so you can have one rod loaded up to do all and then if you like it you're gonna get another rod yeah that's right because 
there's one question I have, which is how many more rods do you need? <laughs> That's right. And the answer is always the same. Yeah. Just one more. So, so I, so <laughs> how many rods do you have downstairs? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'd guess. I'm thinking. I mean, <laughs> you got two. I, I would say there is just on that wall. There's got to be. Well, there's at least fifty. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> well, we'll count it. We'll count twenty-five. It. There's pretty funny because I think there's, there's more than twenty-five. Yeah. Well, and then combine the two walls. There's at least fifty. Yeah. And now you're getting the yeah. bamboo. So, so you're going to eventually run out of room down there. What are you going to do? The with problem your, is, we need a bigger shop. Companies yeah. come out with new models, and we're going to have the new models that's to right. end with. That's right. Yeah, that's cool. No, that's so, good. We we don't sell any of them. We yeah. try to give away a few yeah. to people every year. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That people that are just getting into it, friends of ours that need somebody that needs a rod. Like yeah. we give away a number of them a year, mm -hmm. or else we'd have a hundred of them down there. Yeah, exactly. you know. Yeah, that's true. All right. Well, I think I think that's about all I have. I want to, you know, thank you both for coming on, and this has been a lot of fun. I think we, uh, it, yeah, like we talked you. at the start, it's hard to imagine where we could take it, and we didn't even touch on, you know, it's been a fraction of the stuff. Yeah. We tried to hit a little John Day, but we got the shoots right here. We've got all the winter stuff. I mean, we, you know, so we'll have to mm -hmm. downline it and get on again. But do you have any anything else you want to leave? Well, I think we. I mean, when you think of John Day, steelhead fishing, it's pretty simple, right? Just get over there and start swinging Just flies. get out there and start swinging. Yeah. So, and have confidence. It's, I mean, the fish are there, and yep. if they're there, they're going to take your fly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if they're not, then they're... Keep looking. They keep, looking. keep, right. they, they keep hunting. Awesome. Well, thanks yeah. again, and uh, we'll see you guys down the line. Yeah, yeah thank you. you. Yeah, thanks. So, there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 76 Interested in renting a high-end rod setup for your next big trip? Head over to wetflyswing.com uh, slash members to check out the Wetfly Swing Society today. That's wetflyswing.com slash M-E-M-B-E-R-S to find out more. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wetfly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.